flow Token brother brought the flow Now it's time for the show Let's go What's going on, guys? Welcome to Revolver Live, the gaming podcast that says forget the past. The future belongs to the nerds. I'm the Beastly Gamer. Today I'm joined by my three amazing co-hosts, which we spent quite a bit of time together this week. Gary Diaz, how you feeling, my friend? I am feeling under the weather. I'm yes. drinking from the bottle. So uh, please go gentle on me. I, I, I wanted to switch it up. and, and, and Yeah, Gary, to um, the bottle. It's a mixture of chesty mentholated cough syrup and uh, pure liquid testosterone so I'll be uh, getting more and more masculine as the show goes on watch that beard by the end of the show Ryan Wilson what's going on sir how you feeling today I'm feeling good man recovering from the grind still at it on D2 um, yeah, uh, it, yeah it's, it's been, hard to get away from that grind. I haven't felt this kind of grind before in my life to be totally honest with you guys and I really appreciate all the help you guys have gifted me this week. It's been a very special time for me as a gamer. Briar Rabbit, the king of all things Destiny and now Destiny 2. How you doing, my friend? <laughs> I bet you are, man. You know what's coming next? The crash. The crash is coming next. You're going to get out of the car and stop. <laughs> You're going to walk toward the door and black out. You're going to wake up in the driveway. <laughs> it's good to see you guys. Revolver Live is a gaming podcast with six revolving topics. Become a part of the show by submitting your topic for consideration at revolvergamescast at gmail.com. That's revolvergamescast at gmail.com. We go live every Sunday at 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv forward slash briar rabbit. That's twitch.tv forward slash briar rabbit. The video is then shared on YouTube at Briar Rabbit's YouTube channel and my channel, Beastly Gamer. If you're unable to see the live feed or video formats, be sure to check us out in podcast form on Podbean, iTunes, or your favorite podcast service provider. And with that said, welcome to Revolver Live, episode nine. What's going on, fellas? Yo, Beastly, you played yeah. Trials of the Nine for the first time, right? You never got around to Trials of Osiris. No matter how much I talked about it in Destiny 1, you never got around to it. But now you've no, tried it. You tried Trials of the Nine last night. What'd you think, man? What'd you? Oh man, honest, I, honest opinion here. I, you know what? It's it's a very tactical and skill based portion of the game. Uh, as someone who's been doing ninety nine percent of PVE, going mm -hmm. into the Crucible and then going into Trials of the Nine is a different ballpark altogether. You got to be prepared. You got to be cautious. And you got to have a good shot and a weapon that can get the job done. It's very, very tactical. Uh, and, and you've got to work as a team. And to me, that really, uh, it adds. It adds so much more to the experience that I've been having so far. Uh, I played it with my wife this morning. She played Trials of the Nine for the first time. She, we got destroyed, but we had a great time doing it, right? <laughs> Last night, we actually played and we got five wins in a row. And uh, that was a euphoric moment for me because, like you said, I never played Trials of Osiris. I, you know what? I never even upgraded a weapon in the original Destiny 1. I just never learned the lore. I never really cared. For some reason, this game for me is a different type of animal than Destiny 1 was. I want to learn as much as I can. I want to do as much as I can. And going to, uh, you know, going to the Trials of the Nine with you guys it was a gift. I appreciate it, man. And I can't wait to get back in there with you guys. Gary, I played with you briefly for about 10 minutes yesterday, and you had to bounce. It was late. So hopefully this week we can keep your uh, keep your ass up I, you know, a little bit I, later and play some, play some to I, the Beast. I mean, I, I'm going to be honest. I didn't want to be rude. I, I saw your KD at the end of the game, and it was just like, go, go, go. <laughs> The PV well, penis was not big enough for Gary. I, I can make you feel better. My KD on this go. is way better, Gary. And now we'll never play again. So, <laughs> there we go. Dick joke, SNES portable. Out the Yobo. Of the way. <laughs> Yobo reference out of the way. Yeah, Briar. <laughs> uh, Trials of the Nine was something I'd never experienced before. I'm looking forward to trying the raid. I can't wait to hear what you guys did there. But uh, that's something that I saw. And, of course, we went through two areas of getting loot 
after we completed five consecutive matches. I want to do seven matches. I want to, you yeah. know, I, that's something for me to shoot toward. Even getting five was very uplifting, and, and I felt like we reached some type of precipice. And to know that there's something even further than that, now I got something I want to do over and over again. There is a particular weapon that you must use in this mode that I saw 90% of our opponents using, uh, which is the Mita Multi Tool. And I went in there with uh, Sweet Business, which is my exotic auto rifle, and I thought it was going to deliver the business, but. <laughs> You know, the store got closed uh, because <laughs> I had a multi-tool completely you know, obliterated me before I had a chance to even get a few rounds off. So I'm looking forward to, you know, getting my character in order, getting the weapons I need and getting back in there. But again, I really appreciate you and Wilson very much for uh, walking me through that and teaching me the ropes yesterday. Hey, man, you did good, dude. It was a lot of fun. Um, like you said, you... Meet a multi-tool is a fantastic weapon for that game mode. You get a lot of utilities from it. You get boosted agility. You get radar when you're aiming down sights. And Damn. Uh, an amazing, super fast reload. I mean, the gun is, I mean, it reloads super quick. It allows you to put shots down range really fast. And it's got high caliber rounds in it, which delivers a lot of flinch. A lot of those sights in on that map are long and perfect for that scout rifle range. Um Another thing, too, is that people tend to play a little bit more passive, meaning that they're going to group up and team shot until they get a body, you know, and then they're going to push. So mm -hmm. the meet a multi-tool is perfect for that, and then you push with your secondary and clean up the rest. Um, no, man, it was a lot of fun. I'm glad you had a chance. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you had a chance to jump in, dude, and experience it, because it is vastly different from the Trials experience that we had in Destiny 1. You know, it was Trials of Osiris. Now it's Trials of Nine. And it is a completely different beast. Um, we had a lot of fun. Um, managed to secure a flawless myself, Gary Breyer. I know you guys did as well. Um, Ooh. How did you guys? Uh, how did you guys feel about that that card? Like the, the did you guys did it feel as satisfying as it did in Destiny One? Or um, I think I've, I've hit up this one myself. I've got some reservations about the game mode. Um, I got actually. I played a couple of flawless. I'm um, hoping to get my third in before the end of the the weekend on my next character. And from someone that's that's a long time trials player and someone that played a lot of trials in Destiny One, I don't know what it is that I can't quite put my finger on. But there's, I, I think it might be the team dynamic. But there's just less of those hero moments where you can't carry a team as effectively as you could previously. So you know, if it's that one v three situation that you you are quite often in in, in classic Destiny. Um, unless you've got power ammo and a very inexperienced team that are going to let you utilize that power ammo, um, it's very difficult to clutch those scenarios, especially with it being now an objective game mode. So from my perspective, I feel like it's a very satisfying mode if you've got a cohesive team that you work well with and a team that you enjoy playing with. But if you're the type of player that likes to lone wolf it and likes to you know, have these moments of, of real clutch, I, I didn't find as many of those. What, what's your view on that, uh, Brian? Did you... I have, I have a similar view. I, I find that with Destiny PvP overall, Destiny 2 PvP overall, the lone wolf kind of play style is really just not as effective as it was in Destiny 1. I mean, you can still do it, if, especially if you're up against a weak team. You can still do it, you know, and all of a sudden you can pull flanks and, you know, uh, you know, just be mowing through people. But when you're on a, when you're playing a team that seems to be of the same skill level as you, you definitely want to be you know hip to hip with your teammates team firing going behind cover letting your other teammates come out of cover and continue firing for you um but yeah the lone wolf play style and destiny 2 pvp in in general i find is it's much harder to pull off the supers don't feel as strong the grenades aren't as strong it's really just about gunfights um and you know if you're getting shot at by two people you're you know you're at a major disadvantage because you can't just Toss a grenade at one of them and start shooting the other. Really have to actually shoot everybody. Um, yeah, I'm finding I, I, even I, the. Go ahead, Gary. Sorry. I no, was, was going to say even the point. even the power ammo, which a lot of people are saying, well, you know, you're meant to make plays with the power. It's a temporal advantage and something that you use. The problem is where um, it's been leveled down to. I wouldn't say dumbed down. That's the wrong word, but like at least made so transparent. There's there's no stealth there. So if I pick up a shotgun. Everyone knows I've got a shotgun. So if the guys know what they're doing, they'll just stay away from every single corner and my power's nullified. Same way if I pull a sniper, they can just camp the objective and stay out of sniper lanes. And again, my power's completely nullified. Um, and then all they can do is come around a corner, two people at once. And as you say, a 2v1 is 
frankly impossible with a primary versus two other primaries, um, so long as you're equal skill leveled individuals. So, yeah, my concern of it on the long term is it's going to be more about how effective your team is and not how good a trials player you are. So your moment to moment will, experience is going to base on that. I will say map. The maps seem to make a difference there too. Like some maps lend themselves to lone wolfing a little more. What's the what's the map that we had in the PC beta that was kind of like uh, concentric circles with uh, javelin points in it? Yeah. yeah, javelin. That one seems to me I'm able to move around that map more freely without having a teammate by my side because if I do get into trouble, I can easily duck out and get to cover. Um, and teams seem to split up more on that map because there's so many corners. It's an easier map to kind of run around solo on than something like the Trials map this week, which had a ton of very long lines of sight, uh, big open areas. Like, if you popped into a doorway, you very well could see four Midas just absolutely, you know, pointing You're right at your direction. And if they all team shot at you at the same time, I mean, you were down instantly. Um, so it, map design has a little bit to do with that too, I think. I saw a lot of what you guys are talking about for sure. Um, I feel like, you know, the whole lone wolf thing is definitely taking a backseat as well, but there was definitely some clutch rounds. And yeah, a few of them were like Gary said, you get power ammo and the, the other team didn't respect it or they're forced to push to you planting the bomb you know what i mean so you can kind of plan it out that way like okay if you're going to avoid me make them come to you with power ammo make them come to the objective i feel like the clutch is it's not as um direct as it was before where a guy makes a flank and wipes out three people it's more of somebody makes a flank all four guys turn on that one guy he communicates to his team that all four of them are on them and it's almost like a leapfrog thing. Like you, you're yeah. almost kind of leapfrogging where if you do pull a flank and everyone's on you, the rest of your team has to push up, push put forward. the pressure on them. They turn around on you, you know, it's just, it's like a, um, a trickle down. And it's the same thing when you're both watching the same corner, you get shots on a guy, you tuck back in as your buddy's coming out and stuff. But I feel like the clutches are less like obvious you know what i mean like because someone made that flank and got the entire team to look the other way for even two seconds allowed your team the rest of your team to get the angle so i i just don't feel like the the clutches are as obvious as they were before where you grab a sniper and you know wreck people but the game mode, i will though, you can you can kind of clutch because the game mode is an objective style game mode there are a couple of times where i or a teammate they would just work the objective in a way that caused a win where they were significantly outgunned. It was a one v three, a one v four, but they worked that they worked that objective. They set a bomb, uh, and they were able to hold off the enemy team long enough for that bomb to go off. Or in reverse, they were able to go defuse that bomb even though they were massively outgunned. And it's like a passive that, clutch. That felt really good. So the clutch comes in a different way. It's not necessarily wiping out the enemy team. But you actually do win the game anyway, and because it is an objective game mode, like that is now possible. What did you guys think of the change to countdown? Do you, do you like having an objective in Trials of the Nine? I, I, I thought it was going to play yeah. really slow at first, but it didn't. It actually played yeah. out pretty fast. I feel like it's um, there's there's a couple of issues that I had, and I think it's map as well. I feel like um, Temple and Keyhole were too far away from each other. So if one was planted somewhere else, you almost didn't have time to get there. Mm -hmm. So I feel like th there was there was then a mad rush and you're at a massive disadvantage. I understand it's part of the, the game mode there, but I think that's just a map design thing. I think if you had a smaller map and the, the zones were a bit closer together, then there'd be a bit more um, of a tactical thing around planting rather than, oh, they're not here, quickly plant, which was a bit of an issue. Um, but I mean, aside from that, the other thing that I really, really wanted to, to bring up and see what you guys' thoughts are is the rewards. Um, so... Reward-wise, Destiny 1 was all about you had to get the seven wins. You had to get to the lighthouse because it was all or bust. You know, you got your, they your stuff. that, though, even in Destiny 1. T to an extent, but, I mean, if you wanted your adept weaponry, that was the only way you were getting it, wasn't it, out of a lighthouse loot chest. From what I can understand, the only difference between 7 and 0 and 7 and 1 is a class item and, and a... Or sorry, a class item or a um, a piece of arms, like one piece of armor, that you can get. Even if you get one win, 
and then four or five losses, you can potentially still get all the same weaponry that someone can get who's gone fully flawless. Um, the only d- the advantage is one piece of armor and the cosmetic emblems. Do you feel that, and, and bear in mind, this is as good as it's going to get. So the raid, we're going to have hit prestige mode and other harder variants. This is as hard as trials is ever going to be and as rewarding as trials is ever going to be. Are, are you guys happy with that it now indefinitely moving forward? I feel you, man. I kind of said the same thing. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not diminishing what, like other people going flawless and stuff like that. But this sense of accomplishment when we did get done with our flawless card, I kind of thought the same thing. Like, you know, you're you're ascending to the higher tier tiers to get more loot, and as you go up, you can eventually go to the final area to get what Gary was talking about. It's like a pair of arms or a class item, but. Yeah, there was. I was thinking about it, and I was like, man, the only thing that I think I'm missing is the rocket launcher, the fusion, and the hand cannon. So once I get those, what do I go for? You know what I mean? Like, other than just the experience of, hey, we went flawless. Before, there was, I want to collect every adept weapon mm-hmm. because it had a faster aim down sight time. You know what I mean? Like, they could have just put, they could even made, they could even made the weapons for when you go flawless have a different shader that you can only get by going flawless and i would have been okay with that you know what i mean doesn't even have to have a perk for it to be adept in my opinion just something like the emblem's cool i don't know man i don't want to sound yeah. ungrateful or diminish what people are doing or anything like that because there's definitely some some cards where i got my ass kicked you know what i mean and it definitely felt like i had to work for it you know that we had to work for it so <clears throat> i don't know like it it's cool and all because it gives everybody access to the same rewards and stuff. So I'm kind of like 50-50 on it. I like that everybody gets rewards. Like I, I think that's actually really, really cool because it encourages more people to get into Trials of the Nine. You, I don't, I don't feel forced to get a flawless card to feel rewarded for my time in Trials of the Nine, which I think is a good thing. But it I is. would have liked to see yep. an adept version of the weapons and armor that are only available if you do get a flawless card. Because then there is there is another step, right? There's another there is a reason to really shoot for that seven and zero. Oh. Whereas right now, yeah, you know, like Wilson was saying, I have a lot of the stuff already. Yeah. You know, the DLC is a long ways away. Will the DLC have a refresh for Trials of the Nine armor and weapons? I don't know. You know, in the past, it's we spent a year, I think, with the original Trials stuff, or no, spent like a three months with the. No, it was over a year with the original trial stuff. Yeah, and then yeah. they refreshed it for another year, right? Mm-hmm. They refreshed it at Rise of Iron. Yeah, it was. Well, there's been three different. Year. There's been three different loot pools for Trials well, cons- of Osiris. I mean, the concerns that I'm hearing from watching um, streamers who are trial streamers, and not so much from their commercial business, but just from the the mode and what they've liked about it. They like the mode. They like how it plays. The concept of the lighthouse, though, if you compare it to what they've done for PVE. Every PvE mode has a harder variant that you can go on to. So you've got the strikes where you can move on to the nightfall and then the prestige nightfall. So that's something to strive for and be, you know, um, if you are an elite player, you can move to there. The raid is going to have the prestige raid. Trials itself seems to have flawless, um, which is, you know, obviously, as you say, Wilson, I'm not trying to diminish it, something that you achieve, but there's only one tier of achieving it. So there's no prestige flawless. You can't earn anything additional uh, that, cosmetic or not. I would argue that you wait about four months and there probably will be a prestige level of flawless when, right. <laughs> when there's far fewer players in there. It's just going flawless is a bit a lot harder. You know, I mean, I, I've, I've yeah. played a lot less of this mode than you guys, but one thing that uh, we talked about this morning, Justin Inner Black Ninja, who you guys will probably be seeing very soon, my wife and myself, we are in a, in a party together in Trials of the Nine. And my wife was brand new to the to the mode. I had just started with you guys yesterday, and we were going up against people who went flawless. And for me, that felt a little off. You know, you're going, to, you got someone who's totally new. I feel like Bungie should enact some type of protocol for people who have never done it before. People you who shut have your spent... whore mouth. They God did. It, they did beastly in D1. <laughs> it started off connection based, like it is right now. So you and could. It was beautiful, beastly. You could match beautiful. up against. Really? Yes, it's a beautiful thing. You could, so meaning our first game on our card, we could match up against somebody who's on their flawless game, who's already been playing, already been you know synergy working the map well. They got a plan that works, and they're going to stick to it. On the other side, 
you could be on your flawless game and be going up against somebody's first game where you've already got your methods down, you've already got your lanes, your job, your synergy, gotcha. and gotcha. these guys are just jumping in. So it's a give and take thing. They switched it to where it was win based, which led to longer match times, poor connections, and you had most every single time you got to your flawless game, you were playing against somebody on the opposite side of the world who had a red bar that did not affect their gameplay, but did everything. Destroyed my argument. It was and, the and, sweatiest and of the sweatiest, man. It was unbelievable. The way Trials started right after it launched, I thought it was a wonderful game mode. And it got, to me, the game mode got progressively worse as it went along because they kept making changes to it that made connections worse. They made they made all sorts of changes to it that just, it, it made it less enjoyable over time. Um, but yeah, it seems to be fairly connection-based now. Did you guys have any problems with connections? No, not at all. The only thing I, I think right. I saw it, one it Titan one that was kind of a little sketchy, but. Last it's night, the yeah. usual like shoot a guy and you think he gets away and he gets around the corner and you're like and then he goes down and you're like hmm yeah. I did land my shots <laughs> you know what we, I mean and we have worse connections in the EU um, definitely so some of the EU tubers as well um, that were putting stuff out and the EU streamers if you watch some of their clips I think a good good example is DPJ if you follow him on Twitter he had a 10 second clip on on Twitter of someone that he thought you know the guys that are kind of like just flying up into the air and just dropping back down as they move. Um, yeah, we were getting some wonky connections in the EU, right. but that's that's to be expected. We've got longer distances between sort of community hubs, whereas you guys are pretty much on top of each other in the States. So, yeah, um, different experiences. And Bungie servers as well, where they host from the physics servers are all in the US. So you guys have the best possible experience on Destiny in comparison with the rest of the world. Yeah, you got the best but, everything. But with all that said, I had a blast. <laughs> and it was a good time. And I can't wait to do more. Yeah, that's it. I, I agree. I, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I really enjoyed the experience. I thought they did an awesome job with like kind of the setup for it. And I really like how you go in and you get to see, you know, you get to see your team and you get to see the enemy team, like kind of like, you know, do their like emotes. emotes. I wouldn't mind if they would just cut out your team and just show the enemy team to speed things up a little bit. Maybe yeah. even add a skip button. <laughs> yeah, it but, was cool the first time. Yeah, it was super cool. And then when you actually complete your card and go to get your rewards, that's pretty next level. I don't want to really spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it yet, but uh, you go to a really cool destination. And uh, the nice thing about this destination, as compared to the lighthouse in Destiny One, is that it's much more accessible to everybody. You're not gonna you're not gonna see people in chat, you know, on YouTube videos saying, "I never got to the lighthouse. I never got to see it." It was content that I paid for, but I never got to see. No, everybody's going to get to go see this thing. If you can win one match, I think you get to go there. That's cool. Yeah, just just to get you prepared before you go, just watch Pink Floyd's The Wall, I think we decided was. <laughs> yeah, and that's all we'll that say that. about it, the Gary game. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm actually uh, pleasantly surprised at how much I'm enjoying this game. Uh, it's been, what, two weeks since the game is released. Mm -hmm. I haven't played anything else. And you guys know me. You've known me for years, Briar. I'll find a way to squeeze The Last of Us into my life. And you said last th night that Last of Us had a graphical update. You haven't even checked it out yet. I don't give a damn about it. Uh, to be totally <laughs> honest, I've seen it all, right? And I hate to say that. Please, uh, Bruce Straley, Neil Druckmann, don't don't uh, hit me up on Twitter and, and cuss me out. Last but, of Us 2 is calling him, and he straight put he straight ignored look, him. <laughs> I've just been uh, enjoying this game. It's it's so rewarding it to me. And I, I'm, I'm one of those guys that, you know, Destiny 1, I know that it had – a special recipe that called people back. It called you guys back over and over again. Briar called you for years. And for a long time, I looked from the sidelines and wonder what that, that thing was that, that kept you so engrossed with the experience because I played it. I played it, you know, as a person who's kind of passively playing it, not learning the lore, not finding out everything you could do because I, I felt like I didn't have the time and I didn't want to figure it out. To me, the game seemed so repetitive and, and, it didn't seem like it was rewarding me for anything. I was buying DLC and never going to raids. I was like, this is shit. This seems so different for me. Every time I do anything, I'm getting some kind of crazy reward. You know, I'm leveling up my character. I'm actually considering now, you know, as soon as I get to the max, starting a new character finally for, for the first time in my life. These are things I'm actually looking forward to. 
And now I feel like I can't stop playing this game, which sucks because I used to talk a lot of shit about Destiny. Uh, I did. And, 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 and you know, even when I said it, now. <laughs> even when I said it to you guys a, a few uh, weeks ago, I told you, Briar, in a private conversation that I think I want to play this game for a year. When I said it, I kind of cringed on the inside. I was like, well, if it's like Destiny, I probably won't. <laughs> But it's maybe it's it is like Destiny, and I just didn't take the time to experience it the way it really needed to be. But right now, Destiny Two is at the top of my radar. It's like the only game that matters to me. Uh, it's so it's so great. I just love everything Yo, about it. You so got to check out the raid then. Yeah, yeah, the I definitely raid do. Is thick. It's thirteen sick. hours later. Oh, huh. yeah. <laughs> that won't take yeah. thirteen hours now. That was a blind run, trying to figure yeah. out everything yeah, as we went. Man. Honestly, Good job. I, I was telling you guys last night, I was so sick that day, too. And yeah. Was literally. <laughs> like, I mean, I had liquid coming out of holes, and it was not supposed to come out of them. <laughs> it was bad news, man. Real bad. Oh, man. <laughs> just just, just that scream that you're peeing. I'm peeing again. Yeah. You're not supposed to spend that much time in the raid, man. It says that, that right a, in the That disclaimer. was an exotic debuff, I can tell you. <laughs> it was exotic, all right. <laughs> Miss Rabbit was Miss, Miss Rabbit was screaming to him. Miss Rabbit said, "Are you in there peeing again?" He said, "Yeah, <laughs> yeah." <laughs> yeah, I I can't wait. We got to get the raid done uh, as a group so that we can yeah. we talk about that some more. Uh, it is really fun though, and it's it, it really feels like a unique experience to any of the Destiny One raids. Really cool looking. Um, it's got a different tone. It's a much more I would say jovial tone than. Some of the uh, like world-ending catastrophes that awaited us if we didn't, if we you know failed. It, it was a cool raid. It's a lot of fun. I can't wait to play it with you guys. Well, a lot of the raids had themes to them. You know what I mean? They'd have like a theme, like a name for the raid. And yeah. if I had to choose one for this raid, it would be exploration. Oh yeah, it's There's very a, very vast. It's it feels like it's as big as any of the other destinations on the map. Like if you. If you were to go to that European Dead Zone or Nessus, it feels like the Leviathan is that big. Um, it's It's got like your really? regular raid areas, but then there's this whole underbelly that you can explore, and it's just so vast. It really is cool. It's very apparent the moment you load in it's the size of how a vast it's going to be. It's I, I would say that it's equivalent to one of the planetary social spaces in size, for sure. Wow. And it's very apparent the moment you drop into the raid. I'm not, I, I'm kind of being careful about what I say because it's, it's that special when you experience it for the first time. Um, you load in, and you're instantly overwhelmed within the first second. And I don't mean by enemies. I don't mean by combat. Combat. I just mean by just the vastness and the detail of the very opening part of the raid. And it's a yeah. lot of fun. It is a bitch to get through if you don't know what to do. Fortunately, there's a lot of people out there who have done it multiple times. And we seem to be, a lot of people seem to, the community seems to be developing a overall strategy. Yeah. And I'm guessing within the next week or two, it'll be on farm for sure. But oh yeah, man, was it a bitch blind, dude. We, we bowed out a little bit before you, Briar. So kudos to you guys, man. You guys were just hanging in there and i ended up watching your guys's completion to the end because i wanted to see how you guys did it versus what we were doing and uh came back at it the next night and that's how we ended up actually finishing it so that's a cool raid i i, I want to talk about it more once everybody's had a chance to do it because i really i thought it was awesome and me and I, gary were supposed to do it today i had to bail because i'm not gonna lie i just read my photo shoot schedule today <laughs> you sure did <laughs> Um, so real quick, uh, Wilson, how long did it take you to complete the the raid your first time through? Just curious, because um, you went blind as well too, right? Until yeah. you saw the end. Yeah, we went in blind, and then some people we hit we hit a wall at an area of the raid where a lot of people hit the wall. <clears throat> it's called the uh, the pleasure gardens. There is no that pleasure like in the pleasure gardens. There is place. no pleasure to be had in those gardens. There's <laughs> plenty. Yeah. There's plenty That's of garden. Your window, man. It, it sounds it's, great. It's the exact opposite of pleasure. Damn. Actually, it was yeah. it was the spot that was gonna that that decided that either you had the right team to complete this raid or you didn't. <laughs> wow. It was. So that's where Pink well, Floyd's "The Wall" comes in. Yeah. I mean, I'm gonna plant a seed of, uh, I guess, a 
idea in the head. There was there was plenty of doggy style in the pleasure gardens. Oh, well, <laughs> indeed. I, I need to see this place. Well said. So basically, we got to that. Some people had to leave. We had already been four plus five plus hours in by the time we got to that part. Some people had to leave, so we took a couple hour break, and I ended up getting in with a different group, making it to the end boss, hit a wall there, um, ended up getting off at night. So I think it ended up taking me close to 13-ish hours in total. Wow. Close to 12, 13 after I had the put thing it in. I'll say, though, is that, that those numbers, those day one numbers, it it's like once you understand what's going on at the Pleasure, the pleasure Garden, Ooh, it's not good. as difficult as it was figuring right. it out. Like just, just figuring out the strategy to clear that. We were I, I could say my group was doing it so fucking wrong. <laughs> like so wrong. Like we were just making it a hundred times harder than it had to be, you know? So yeah. it's like oh, don't let those twelve, thirteen hour totals <clears throat> in a week it'll be an hour and a half completely. Yeah, and somebody had the solution to it, and we're like, no, that's surely that's not it. <laughs> Always keep that in mind. If there's, don't be so quick to dismiss a strategy because you, we definitely shot it down a few times, and it ended up being the winning strategy. <laughs> so. if, if you guys were to try, like you and Gary were planning on running it today, how much time had you allotted for this raid? Four hours, maybe. Um, I had scheduled up for yes. two hours, and I wanted to be done for by five, so we could start the show at six. So. Hours. Three hours. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally didn't go for day one rating. Um, I could have done. I uh, had a couple of people that as well had slots, but I'm not much of a PvE player. So me personally, I'd rather get in, experience it, get it done, get out. Because it sounds like an idea of torture to me to spend 14 hours in there. But, you know, more power to people. <laughs> I'll let you guys go it in. It sounds pretty it, bad. Yeah, Gary, you're It's right. like the, the, you know, the Omaha landings. You know, you guys go in and take out the machine guns on the beach. And then I'll come in with the 2nd Battalion and just yeah. cruise up in my Humvee. <laughs> Pick up all the loot. <laughs> I really like it. To me, it's, it's always one of the highlights of a Destiny release. Going into a raid blind, figuring it out with your... Trying to just, you know... Work those puzzles exactly what has to happen and yeah there's a lot of failure there's some frustration but i really feel like bonds are formed in that kind of an experience that yeah. you don't get in a, I, I think you do get it from pvp as well like you know just i think you get it from trials as well just trying you know because it's very difficult you really have to like work as it's you're gonna get frustrated other people are gonna you know have elation so you kind of get like the range of emotion that I think does really form those bonds. And, you know, day one raid definitely does. And I think Destiny is the only game as well that has it anymore. So coming from a World of Warcraft background for years and years and years now, World of Warcraft has had a uh, public test realm. So any raids that are coming out are on the test realm for like, you know, two, three months before they drop. So everyone knows what the bosses are going to be and oh, what the tactics are. And what the so they don't have like a race to complete the raid? There's still a race to complete it. You won't complete it for months. Uh, it's not about knowing the tactics. It's about executing on them. So it's a very diff different model. You know what you need to do, but in World of Warcraft, you need 25 people to execute perfectly. Are you kidding me? Yeah, it's it's very, very difficult. You know, it's you need to have the best possible gear that you can. You need to be DPSing at absolute min-max level. Your movement needs to be spot on. If one or two people mess up, the raid wipes. Um, it's all time. There's all like, it, again, it's a different model. It's it's less about knowing what to do and more about can you do this perfectly for 22, 23 minutes or whatever the encounter is, you know, and, and do that again and again and again throughout. So th different models. But yeah, Destiny is one of the only games anymore that has that blind raid element. So it's quite unique. Wow. You just scared me out of trying World of Warcraft, but <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> You almost had him there, Gary. You almost. almost he said, takes, had him. It almost takes months to do. I was like, wait? <laughs> 25, 25 gamers put work together to fuck up. It's a wipe. I'm like, what? It, not just gamers. That. World of Warcraft gamers. Gamers, yeah. Mm. Those are different, a different <laughs> kind of animal there, Brian. Yeah. These Holy are some toxic smokes. people. They've got the, the DPS meters at the end of it. They've got you bent over a yeah. barrel if you're un under the red line threshold. They're like, you know, there's some, there's some toxic bitches on that game. Trust <laughs> I've me. seen some is. funny wow. ass videos on world of warcraft raids of the raid guy that's usually talking over everyone and there is some hilarious chatter and i'm, I'm telling you man it's like boot camp for video games they are on your ass and you will not get invited back unless you hit that standard and gary is that standard let's be I, real i feel like gary is the guy talking in that video <laughs> right <laughs> probably is 
<laughs> you're you're a hundred thousand points below the DPS standard. <laughs> yeah, Gary's that dude. You're not welcome here. You're not Can you justify you... this to me? Can you justify in three <laughs> sentences why are you're you doing drunk? That? <laughs> why did you not cast? Did your wife have child? a baby during the raid? Because that's the only excuse I'll accept. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time, it's they drop their Cheetos on their keyboard or something of that nature. <laughs> I can't hit the W key. There's Cheeto dust stuck underneath it. <laughs> shitty excuse. Shitty excuse. I can no longer cast Intimidating Shout. Help. <laughs> uh, what else we got for topics today? Let's, let's move uh, on. But before we move on to the next yeah. topic, uh, I wanted to hear you guys' thoughts on Destiny 1.5's resurgence. Mm. Huh? What's that now? So this is um, a lot of the, the embargoes for reviews or whatever it is. You know, people have seemed to have, have started dropping scores. You know, it used to be reviews in progress. Oh, okay. And now we're seeing final reviews come out. And we're seeing now a lot of people that have played the content and the initial day one um, revelations or people being like, oh, this game's amazing. Um, it's not universal anymore. There seems to be a, a definite theme throughout the, not just the reviewers, but the content creator community now that is saying that if you like Destiny, this is a lot more Destiny, but this is more of a reboot than a sequel. Um, it's The core components of the game are the same. The enemies are largely reskinned. The activities are largely the same with some tweaks. Um, everything's just the same but expanded with the things that didn't work cut out and the things that were community hits put in. You know, this truly is Destiny 1.5. So do we, I guess, do we agree? Do we think there's validity in their statements? What do we think? I think this is a semantic argument, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I believe that the Taken King was Destiny 1.5. Like, honestly, it was a hu huge change to Destiny. It it felt like a 1.5. Destiny 2, it does feel like a sequel in the way that Halo 2 felt like a sequel to Halo. Or Halo 3 felt like a sequel to Halo 2. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it feel, Yeah, it still feels like Halo. It's still got the same enemies in it. Still got the same guns in it. But it's a new, you know, there's new content. There's new... There's new stuff. That's how Destiny 2. Yeah, just look at it as like a continuation. You know what I mean? Like it's evolving. You know, like of course there's going to be familiarity with it because that's what makes the game that game. You know, you stray away from that too far and you lose sight of what makes the game that game and why people come back to it. So there has to be something familiar and there has to be something fresh. You know what I mean? And I feel like they did a good job with that. And like I can kind of see where they're coming from, but like dude, I've been playing this game way too much i've been way sinking a lot of time really into it brother. yeah <laughs> and, and i can kind of see where that's coming from but we're not normal people when it comes to this game we are in a very small percentage of people who make time to play the shit out of this game and it's man there's some people out there that have so much stuff left to do and like i envy that you know what i mean like i'm about on my third character damn and man. And like, oh, dude, that's nothing. Some people already got their third characters all 300 and, you know, two 290s and stuff like that. And how I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do after I get my third character? And then I remember that the PCs drop in. <laughs> that's yeah. Destiny October. 2 right there. That's Destiny 2. Yeah. Did you see <laughs> Gary go from 6 to midnight right there all of a sudden? Um, the like, desk so just like rose in front of me with no hands touching it. It was, <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> Did you say PC? I, and, and Wilson, <laughs> you hit the nail on the head for me, right? For me in Destiny, even though I'm playing this a lot more than any game in recent memory, for me, when it comes to games, I'll just say Destiny, I feel like I'm a pretty normal person. I'm trying as hard as I can to make as much time as I can for this game. But it's like you guys are my friends, my co-hosts. Every time I see you, you guys have done something insane. You've already completed all this stuff. And I'm like, how the hell am I even in the same group with these guys? And so I feel like I'm just a normal guy trying to keep up with the gods of destiny. And it sucks hard. I keep telling you guys on Twitter, I got to get rid of some of these kids well, and responsibilities so I can sink more time into this game. I offered because you I feel a valid solution yesterday and you refused it. Briar offered to buy my kid. <laughs> <laughs> and then he upped his price when he found out she sucks boobies. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, right. <laughs> now the and, reason why you're in the same group as us is because you send us nudes. No, seriously, it's because you're yourself. Don't tell everybody. It's because you're yourself, man. It's not about being having the first being the first to complete the content on the first day, man. It's just about hanging out with friends and 
doing Man. something other than stressful real life shit. You know what Wilson, I mean? thank you so much for saying something awesome that Gary will never say to me. Speaking of video game addiction, that's the first topic for today's episode of Revolver Live. Many studies have stated that playing video games can lead to severe, severe gaming addiction, i.e. not leaving your bedroom unless to eat, spending huge portions of the day playing your game of choice, having little or no social life, and being an all-around useless human being. And I'm not saying that's anyone here. I think these studies have some merit. Uh, as a matter of fact, my sons fall into some of those stereotypes. I also believe that these studies can be subjective. As a gamer, most of my life, including my childhood, I have strived to be productive and have, for the most part, reached the goals I've set for myself. We're a gang of adult gamers who play large portions of games for large portions of our day. So are we video game addicts? Is it possible to be a functioning video game addict? Answers? Hundred percent. It's totally you're totally able to be a functioning video game addict. You guys are the three functional ones, and I'm definitely <laughs> the dysfunctional one. So we have multiple ends of the spectrum here. And I believe coming off Destiny 2, that was a perfect transition because I have definitely been shirking some like just pushing some duties away here and there to um to play have Destiny. You not, have you not shaved your legs since this game came out? I shaved my face for the first time since the game came out. <laughs> and I hastily picked up my room a little bit. You can't see it's over here. I, I uh -huh. sent you guys that text that my wife sent me. Sure did. You need it was to awesome, get a haircut guys. today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In no uncertain terms, don't come back unless it's plucked. There's, His wife is awesome. <laughs> there's certain games, man, that grab me and pull me in for a certain amount of time. And I go, just anything that I pick up that's new, that's very interesting, dude, I go hard. Like, I, it's, I'm very obsessive. It consumes a lot of my thoughts. It consumes a lot of, like, my day-to-day -day activities and stuff. But eventually I'll get to a point where I'll feel like it'll be a little bit more easier to manage, like, my playtime and gotcha. shit that I actually need to do. Um, definitely missed like garbage night a day or two <laughs> and things like just stupid shit. Like it's not anything like, like we're for, like we're forgetting to pay bills or anything like that, but like it, it's, it's, it's little things and it's definitely because destiny two is out. Yeah, and well, after I, a I while, man, I'll, I'll even back out. I'll plateau. So to speak. Missing garbage night. People don't think it's a big deal, but trust me, if you, if you live with a woman, deal. that shit's a big deal. All right. You, you got that yeah, trash can outside too, like smelling. Shit, oh my God. It gets filled up in a week and you can't let it go for two weeks because the, the know, reason I think trash. that's because people don't understand how to properly pack trash yeah it's like tetris man i think like if, if you had like a bunch of heterosexual men living together the trash would never go out because you'd be so effective at packing it like i think if you're a man in your like i'd say 25 30 you hit your peak and then from then on you kind of maybe to track down a little bit but at that point there you are you're such an effective finely tuned trash packing machine <laughs> i can get like seven pizza boxes squared up and put into it i can jam like seven milk cartons it's great like you know what i, I hate just see, gary is when somebody puts a two liter bottle in the in the recycle bin they don't squeeze the bottle get the air out that's just I'm like amateurs space. amateurs damn right sorry bro i'll Next time I throw one in there, I'll be sure to. <laughs> I don't if you get a can, you take it outside first, stamp on the can to flatten it, then put it in. If you get, you know, crisp bags, suck them first to get the air out, tie them in a knot. Man, I'll do anything to not take the trash out. Like, I will go through these like loop holes. Would you do. like to move in, Gary? Look, uh, let me just say this real quick. This, and I'm sure for you guys, you'd probably agree, is Destiny a Destiny 2 is a game that you guys are addicted to. Because to well, be totally okay. honest. All right, hold on. Now, when you say addiction, right, there's there's qualifiers for what addiction is. There's compulsive behavior, right, and there are consequences, right? Okay. You continue to do a compulsive behavior in spite of adverse consequences, right? Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any adverse consequences because they're playing Destiny 2? I might, so much other shit I might raise doing. my hand a little bit. I, I did talk earlier about having four hours of sleep, like for multiple days in a row. Yeah. My wife is getting a little on the edgy side. She understands, but she wants to go out to dinner. <laughs> yeah, those are adverse effects, bro. But uh, like at the same time, it's like you know, this is my job. Let's yeah. be honest, right? This is my job. It's what I do. 
You're so awesome. And when I, you know, when something like this comes along, it's a special not thing. Not just about wanting to play as much as I can because I do. It's also about, you know, like I need to capitalize on this because this is the season that I make the bulk of my money for the year. Mm-hmm. Right? Is the season between September and December, I'll make 50% of my revenue for the entire year. 50 cent of my- Fifty percent of my income for the entire year will come in a few months. So it's it's partly addiction. It's also partly just like priority. You gotta work, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, well, for me, right? Uh, very few times have I had a game that just sucked me in like this. I just got done cutting my kids' hair. Uh, my boy's hair, and I got done with their hair at 5 o'clock, and I came in here and I sat down in front of my laptop, and Kate was over there playing her game, and she looked at me and she said, come on. And I was like, well, I gotta get ready to do the show. She was like, you don't have a few minutes to do this mission? I was like, I, maybe after? And she like kind of got up and looked at me like, you fucking loser. And she stormed out. Uh, this is a game that's really got us, and she doesn't even have gonads, but if she did, she'd be got by the gonads. And this is all I talk about. This is the only game that I really think about right now, and it's really frustrating to me because I got over 300 games on PS4, a lot of them, and this is the only thing, and it doesn't feel like I'm going to feel different anytime soon. So much shit I haven't seen. I still haven't seen The Nightfall. Still haven't seen The Raid. Just got introduced into Trials of the Nine. I've never uh, upgraded or started any other characters Beastly, did you have a chance to play the PC beta? I'm just curious. No, I did not. No. I mean, I'm curious. Say, like, are, you, are you planning on getting the PC version? If you guys want me to get it, I'll get it. I mean, I'm getting a gaming PC, so I think it'd be important. But yeah, I'm not a mouse and keyboard guy. And, and one thing that Gary said that rang, rang true with me in the opposite direction is he doesn't know how to play with one of these. The PC Gary version doesn't... worked awesome with it. Yep, awesome. Yeah. Some oh, would really? say too awesome. Yeah. But that's oh, yeah. an argument for another day. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so traditional PC gaming is something I'll probably shy away from. But if it works fine, if I can plug in my Xbox One or my Xbox 360 or my PS4 controller and play it, I'd definitely do that and get down with you guys for sure. There's a lot of games that have controller support for PC, but the biggest uh, rule of thumb with that is you just don't tell Gary that you're using one. No, nah, fuck that. I I tell Gary every time. PUBG team with a controller that was just sure tragic. did. Saying that we sure need to play did. PUBG again, man. I miss that game. Yeah, we do tragic. actually. I they really added a, it. a new city to the map, on that, and they added a fog, a fog effect. What? There's rain. There's sunset. There's time of day. Fog. I, I really want to play that again. Weep was talking yeah. about. It. Yes, just yeah, I fucking it. miss that game. I mean, video game addiction. Um, to chime in my two cents is you gotta you gotta have some vices somewhere, and I think it's one of the least destructive you can possibly have because, you know, I'm either going to be addicted to video games or hookers crack. or crack, yeah. so it's it's going to be you know those are really those. good. Can we just like get the trifecta? <laughs> We start a podcast about that. <laughs> I mean, that just like, it's like an awesome an average podcast Friday for me in that order. Um, no, I mean, you know, Hooker's crack all the and things. Destiny. <laughs> yeah, that's the best. That is a, Which just happens to be the name of the hooker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's meant to be. I think, if anything, she could be the uh, the final man of our trials team if, if uh, BC doesn't want to go in there. So there you go. We've got. Oh this is, this is Destiny. We'll be taking her to the spire today. Destiny you know? does Destiny. <laughs> destiny does Destiny. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's guys that will go out and gamble on a, on a Friday night and they'll spend a ridiculous amount of money on that. You know, there's uh-huh. people that like, like a drink and they'll bring home like, you know, 24 cans of beer and they'll, they'll sit through that. If you're going to sit in on an evening and play a video game um, and say, oh, you've got a problem, you've got an addiction, you know, I, what is it? It's, it's just what you do with your leisure time. I'm going to stare at the wall for the rest of the time. Then anything's an addiction. Right. You know, whatever you do is an addiction. I think the problem comes if you, if you start choosing your, your hobby or your addiction over the other important things in your life. Right. If you're not going to work, if you're not if you're not taking care of your relationship, you're not communicating with your friends. If if that kind of stuff is happening, then you really got to take a step back. You start, you got to look because like if your if family life suffers, if your job, work life suffers, social life suffers. I mean, destiny is a funny thing because it kind of provides other social life. You know, it really does. It's so yeah. weird. Um, but I mean, I. Just because it's not crack doesn't mean it can't be harmful. 
Yeah, I I agree. I mean, you, you guys remember back when uh, uh, Elder Scrolls Oblivion came out, there were people losing their jobs and they were unable to go to work. And usually every Elder Scrolls does this. I don't know about the effects of Destiny, but I'm sure there are a lot of people who get so caught up. And it happens primarily in MMOs. There's been so many people have gotten caught up in, in World of Warcraft. That became their life. And, and they put everything else to the side. And and sometimes people will lose their home, lose their, their car, lose their relationships. There was a guy who sued a video game company about two years ago because he got divorced and he blamed it on the gaming company because he was so enthralled with that experience. And that's why for me, I think I'm a functioning uh, game addict because that is my vice, as, as Gary said. I've always been a gamer and I've told you guys this for years. It's what I did as a kid to, to stay out of trouble because I had friends out in the world who were doing things that eventually got them caught up, you know, in in bad scenarios in the street. And instead of that, my mom had us with a Nintendo, a Super Nintendo, all the way up to we were able to buy our own games. And we stayed there and, and enjoyed that artificial world. And it, to me, it's like people get addicted to Netflix and they'll sit and watch, you know, shows back to back. And it's not really hurting anyone as long as you keep things in check. And that was my thoughts on it. Gary actually wanted to do the same topic. That's why we're in cohesion at least someplace, not in Destiny. <laughs> I, uh, I totally feel you guys. Like, I've had discussions with people. They're like, why you waste your time sitting around playing a video game? And, like, they have the 1980s, 1990s <clears throat> thought of video games in their head of, like, single player. You're not conversing with anyone. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. Um to which I usually respond, you know, like, well, what what did you do last night? You know, just like almost like I'm changing the subject, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. oh, I went and bought a, you know, 30-pack and went home and binge-watched Walking Dead. Okay, you know, how much money did you spend on that 30-pack and you got one night of enjoyment out of it? You know, I spent $60 on a game and I'm probably going to be playing it for the next three years or the rest of my life, I don't mm -hmm. know. You know, like, and I told them it's no different. Like, you sitting on the couch watching a show, drinking a 30-pack, and me sitting down and playing video games and conversing with my friends is two completely different things. It's kind of like what you said, what you do in your own leisure time is you. Some people like to do yard work. Some people like to go for walks. Some people like to sit outside. I like to sit inside and stare at a TV and shoot aliens all day. You know that I mean? sounds like, awesome. I'll be honest, you know, too. I, I am prone to compulsive behavior. When I get into a hobby, it is consuming. Like, me too. It doesn't matter what it is. Mountain biking, golfing, yep. poker. poker. Yeah, poker was, I think I spent seven years where I was just like focused on poker. That's all I did. Mm -hmm. Played poker. <laughs> Played a lot of poker too when the whole No Limit Hold'em thing was like huge, oh, yeah. man. We used, to, we used to go around town and, and hit up It was like people were just giving places. you money. All you had yeah. to do was just know a little bit about how to play and yep. people would just hand you their money. Yep. Because all yeah, they that, saw, they watched, they watched poker on TV and all yep. they saw was people doing the... Sliding in their whole stack thing, right? I'm bluffing my whole stack away, and I'm just like, and I'm not bluffing, and I'm taking your whole stack. Yep. <laughs> hey, yeah, I would never to play poker with you, Brian. Right? Or the people that thought they had a better hand, and they didn't quite understand the rules, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. And they go all in, you know, that oh sort of God. thing. Yeah, we used to hit a lot of tables up, man. And I'm the same way, dude. When I get into something, like it used to be like, modding original xboxes modding 360s cutting them open putting the plexiglass with all the lights and all the different stuff on them it was a lot of fun anything with soldering any, any mm. of that type of stuff like consumed me for the longest time and i'm the same way man when i pick up like a new hobby or something that i'm passionate about dude i just i go hard and I think sometimes, we're all compulsive you know yeah. I, it's, i've heard you say it wilson and briar and i've been compulsive my entire life but but like you guys i'm able to admit that and that's the mitigating factor. It, it makes it easier for you to watch your compulsions and, and understand that you can get so balls deep into anything that it can disrupt, you know, your daily functions and your priorities. And you know, but back to the the, the topic at hand, uh, Gary does not like to play Destiny with Beastly Gamer. Let's try that. All right. What's the next? <laughs> What's the <laughs> next topic? True <laughs> that. I'm not gonna lie. Switching off, so similar thing to video game addiction, actually, it's a nice clean transition. Can we ever not be online any, anymore? So, you know, if you're not playing a game, you're looking at that game, thinking about that game, all the components of addiction, you know, looking around it. If you're not talking about games, you're checking what's happening on the news. If you're not looking at the news, 
you just decided that you really need to know um, what food and aardvark eats and you're looking that up at that moment in time on Google, you know, you might walk by it and you see a, a, you know, an actor that you've not heard of in 17 years it's on something you go, hmm, I wonder what they did. And then you're looking at their filmography on Wikipedia and then that comes up and you think, were they in a film with Joan Rivers? I wonder what Joan Rivers looked like when she was 20. And you just go start looking through that and it's like a dangerous rabbit hole to fall down, to continue going through. There's always something to keep you online and keep you out of the world that you're actually living in around you. Do you guys think that it's possible to ever not be online? Because you almost have to actively force yourself to not be. And secondly, we've got two and a half people here, I guess, that are content creators. Um, is it worse for yourselves who feel an obligation to almost maintain a connection to your craft and your audience? Brad, would you like to elaborate on this first? Or you want me to spill my thoughts? This, this for is me, a weird um, subject. Yeah, go ahead, Beast. For me, at this point, uh, coming from the, the era where internet barely existed to watching it uh, become a reality in the form of dial-up and then you know DS, DSL and all these things that have happened over the years to the point where now every phone is, is a computer and you have the whole world at your fingertips, it's very, very hard to step out of that reality. Uh, when Hurricane Ir Irma came through here uh, last week, and everything got knocked out. My only piece of you know technology that kept me up to date with what was going on was my phone. And Kate was the same way. And we went out there and braved that wind to plug our phones into the car just to get some information, just as so we could find out what was going on. And you're right, it, it, it's, it's an ever opening hole. Every time you look for something, you find something else more interesting or something else that pulls your attention in another direction. The internet is, it's the present and it's, I think it'll always be the future. I just, uh, for me, it's, I'm more curious to see what new form it takes in the next few years, because Briar, you remember dial up. These kids have no idea what that even is. Dude, porn took so long to download. It's ridiculous. You couldn't even download a picture of titties. Dude, it took you, like, you were it took over like it. 10 minutes. Yeah. You were <laughs> over it by the time. Yeah, These were the days this, when uh... you used to have to go into like betterware and stuff and go and get catalogs from clothing stores mm -hmm. and flick to the lingerie section and right. squint at it. And it oh was my kind God, of the Victoria's Secret catalog. That's the end of the month. <laughs> <laughs> we used to just, we used to just go job? into the gas station and act like we were getting other stuff and you'd slowly creep towards the <laughs> Playboy <laughs> magazines. You'd get over there and you'd, it'd be just, you know, I mean, it'd be within reach. You'd get up there and just as you got your hand on it, the cashier would be like, what are you doing? And we'd go over <laughs> and yell at you guys. We'd run out of the store. And, uh -huh. Or the uh, the neighbor always had a big stash of Playboys. We'd always be over at his garage trying to... <laughs> it, the internet, I think it's too late. I think the damage is done. I think it if is. you try to take away the internet right now, it'd be like equivalent to taking away, say, the automobile. There's a lot of people... You depend on your car every day to get to work. There's a lot of people who depend on the internet every day to do their work and things like that. And Most it's people. a lot of people. And a lot of businesses, like there's... The reason why things, there's such ease of access with everything nowadays, whether it be information, products, entertainment, anything like that, there's a reason why it's all so easily accessible now. And it's because of the advancements of the internet. And I'm with you, man. I can't wait to see what the next form it takes because at some point in time, somebody will come along who reinvents the wheel yeah, and it's basically going to be makes a it better. Part of us. I mean, hopefully we won't get into that transhumanism uh, humanism stuff, but. It'll be glasses and rings and watches and, and things like that that are more powerful than the phones we, we carry with us today. And, you know, think about the effects that the Internet has had on the environment. You know, the paper industry is dying uh, because of email and because of the, the way we're able to converse and send messages around the world now instantaneously. Uh, it's a, everyone's dependent on, on, on some level. My mom, who just got her first smartphone like two months ago. Now she understands, she sees the light. My dad is constantly sending me emails and messages and YouTube links. And I'm like, wow, this guy's 63 years old. He knows what the hell is going on. It's a part of our society. And, and at this point, it's only going to get better. Uh, it's fucked some shit up though. Like it's fucked some shit up bad. Right? <laughs> it's like you go to a restaurant with some friends and you start a conversation up and half of your friends are looking at their phones. Right? Yeah. You know, yes. That kind of shit is like awful.
kids right now. Like they're the worst. It's it's. You have if a you have a kid a cell phone and it is all consuming, because it's just like they can plunge the depth of any subject or anything <laughs> that they want in the world, <laughs> right? The the ex the actual real world is so less interesting, so less mm-hmm. interesting. I'm watching this happen, and I don't know how to I don't know how to deal with it because, like, what am I going to do? Like, take away like the most valuable tool in the in the history of humanity from these I children? I totally <laughs> or <am> understand. I, gonna... <laughs> I totally understand what you're saying, but do you not like kind of see like our parents back in the day yelling at us about carrying around like a Game Boy or something and like it consuming it's so us? Oh, for sure. I mean, it was comic it's, books for them and their it's parents. Different. You know? It's different, but I mean, it's still something to escape reality, whether it, oh, it be sure. a train set or an iPad. Well, no, I mean, for me, I just I can't be hypocritical and ever begrudge someone looking at it because I personally am probably the biggest single consumer on the entire Internet. I think if you collected everyone's Internet consumption and added it together, you'd still click on less clickbait than I do. I cannot go past an article, right, that says you won't believe what these Hollywood stars look like now. I'll be like, I can't I do all the time. <laughs> navigating porn all must be a nightmare for you. <laughs> I, never, I never get to the porn. I'm too busy looking at, you know, what the kid from the Goonies looks like nowadays because that's what I'm into. Yeah. Yeah. This star's lost so much weight. Can you believe it? No, I can't. Let's have precious. a look. Precious, yeah. That's my day. I will you say this. Believe what precious have you seen like, Honey man. Boo Boo? The mum from Honey Boo Boo, man. She's she like, this now, tiny. Yeah. Really? Looking pretty good for herself. We're clicking on the same shit. Brian, you need to click on them clickbaits. I, 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 I don't know. Like, Over the on. last two weeks, I think you've told me like major revel- revelations about people I know. Like personally, you're like, oh, did you yeah. know this? I'm like, no. <laughs> like yeah. stuff that was on the internet. I was like, no, I didn't know. Oh. <laughs> Blame Reddit, man. Blame Reddit. The best, Reddit. Let me just the say best this was real. when Gary was talking shit about people who's like, who in their right mind would sit here and watch the hurricane? And he then <laughs> 10 minutes later, he goes, right, I got four different news sources up. And he had four watching the hurricane. <laughs> he's reading the chat about the hurricane. Like, so he's watching the newscast and he's got the chat going and he's reading us the chat. <laughs> Which was amazing, by the way. Really I was shout casting the hurricane. They're like Irma. fake news, fake hurricane, fake this. <laughs> I liked fake Mexican tornado was my favorite <laughs> quote. Mexican yes, tornado. Oh my well, god. Look, the the internet the internet damaged my kids, right? My my ex, my, my son's mother, she um always believed that just because who she was, our kids deserve to have the best to be first. And not only keep up with the Joneses, she was like, fuck the Joneses, they're keeping up with us. And so my kids were eight years, Brent was eight and Brandon was seven when she bought them their first cell phone. Yeah. And during that time we were separated and I, I asked her then, I was like, you know, why would you want to get a kid a phone at this at this age? She said, what if they have an emergency? Well, well why don't you get the older one a phone and, and put locks on it? What she the never... fuck kind of emergency is getting and they go from... Look, my boys oh. are 15 and 16, Briar. They probably Ow. made 10 phone calls since that time. Yeah, tell me about it. They don't answer the and, phone when I call and, them. I pay fucking $200 out, right? a month for these fucking things. <laughs> yeah, they just want to check it out, right? Not bitter. Not bitter. My, my, my son, my son, when he was when he was 12, he was on punishment. He was acting up in school, and a lot of it had to do with what he was learning from his, his friends in school on the internet. But he was on punishment, so he had no games. I got him a bag of Stephen King books to read. Sorry, that's just my taste. And uh, there was no game and no phone. So I told him to keep his phone at his mom's house when he came over to our house. This day in particular, I walk into his room. He had earbuds in. The phone's supposed to be gone. And I'm like, what the hell's happening? So I walk over to him, and then he tried to pretend like he was simultaneously falling to sleep. So he was like... <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so I was like, what are you doing, son? And he's like... Huh? Huh? I took the earbud out. I said, what the hell are you doing? He's like, oh, nothing. I said, what are you listening to? I pulled the cover back. Also, his ass bouncing up and down. And so my son, 12 years old, watching hardcore porn. The girl had a nice ass. Uh, but I, I grabbed his phone. Mm-hmm. I walked into the living room. And Kate was sitting there. That was back in the apartment. My older son was there. I said, Brandon's on punishment, right? She's like, yeah. I said, look what he's watching. I aired him out in front of you know Kate and my older son. 
And I, I brought him in the living room and he got his punishment. I called his mom immediately. I said, I told you this would happen. If you open the world up to ch to children, they'll lose their inner, their uh, innocence to the internet. And you my see, son the first sure mistake he made there that you didn't, I'm going to blame you as the parent there, right? Not because he was looking at porn, but because he was looking at porn with headphones on. What a fucking mistake. Like, she was on stage with headphones yeah, yeah. on. He wanted you can't to really get be aware of your surroundings with headphones yeah. on. He wanted to hear those cheeks clap in both ears. <laughs> I mean, anyone with fuck, with like, the mental fortitude of a five year old would just say, turn the volume all the, all the way down. Man, I mean, he was, was yeah, full awareness the... of sounds like a feet coming down the hallway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what wow, I'm really lose... getting closer. <laughs> really lose I, your awareness. Like yeah, I said, man, that's that's a fail as a dad to be like, look, son, if you're going to look at it, make sure you've got ears around you, make sure everything's quiet. You hear the slightest creak from a fucking floorboard ten ten <laughs> like meters down the hallway. It's off. Yeah. True story, guys. We can move on. True story. I, I called their mom, and she was like, "Oh my god, I can't deal with this. I can't believe this. I can't." What was he looking at? I told her what he was looking at. I said, "I'm going through his history." Kate was like, "Wow, he's been looking at this for like three days straight." Just yeah. every type of porn topic possible. <laughs> I'm looking at him like, damn, boy, you must have been like data from Star Trek typing on that phone. <laughs> and then his mom, she took his phone, and I thought she was doing the right thing. And I swear to you, like two days later, she bought him an iPhone. I was like, it's over. I picture him like Johnny Five from Short Circuit going, <laughs> input, need more <laughs> input. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's just got really built on one arm for some reason. You can't work it out why, but the guy's just You've been like, playing oh, a lot of tennis? That right arm, man. He must be really hitting that four, forehand smash well. Yeah, he's got no, you just can't find any Vaseline in the house anymore. Like every pot of Vaseline is just gone. Yeah. God damn it, I just like, bought this shampoo yesterday. <laughs> why, why, are the, why are the towels stuck together, Kate? We can't fucking get the towels apart. You know, he did what kids do. But he was on punishment. He got caught. That fucking internet did it to my son. Well, he did it to himself. Technically. That was a bit of double doozy because not only did he get caught, he used the phone when he wasn't supposed to use it. Yeah. He was supposed to use it for a hard too. I was like, damn, Brandon. <laughs> Thank God none of his friends watch Revolver Live. I, 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 I can't I, you just told that story. Poor we guy. had a similar experience, Beastly, and I, I had that conversation with him. Like, look. The same shit when you were I was a kid, <laughs> but here's the deal: like the shit has gotten way more crazy now. So like that's why we're restricting it. That's why we're locking this down. Is can't we don't want you to get a false idea of what sexuality actually looks like as an adult from the shit you're seeing on the internet? Because that shit is crazy. Check like, it's out. crazy. No, it's not what seven. you want. Nova Seven. She has YouTube for kids on a Roku TV. Uh, a few months ago, it was here. Uh, Kate was in there, and I checked Nova's history, and she wrote, "What is sex?" Yeah, I yeah. asked her. I said, "I said, what did you what did you hear about sex?" She said, "Someone said it on one of the videos." I said, "That's not for kids to ever look up. You don't ever look at that word. Try to find out what that word is. When you become a, a lady, when you're 35, then you'll find out what sex is." Okay. <laughs> when when I'm old, when I'm dead and gone. Yeah, you figure it day. out. That's the day. Only to be until you know what? She'll. I'll leave a note on the top of my casket. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Shit. Internet man, it can really open some doors that you don't want open for the for the innocence of the world. You know, yeah. we're already corrupt. We're corrupt as well. I get I get completely overwhelmed by social media sometimes. As a content creator, I feel like I should be kind of constantly monitoring it. But like, you know, sometimes you just want to like leave that phone in a different room and just have some peace and quiet, right? And then, but then, like, you feel like people are getting pissed off at you, you know? Like, oh, you're not responding right away. I know that phone's in your pocket. You know, like, I know that it's there, and people get mad at you. I, I really get overwhelmed by the, the social media aspect of it. Damn. Yeah. You know, I, sometimes I catch I... myself at restaurants doing, like, me and Sam will be there, and I'll be like, we're both on our phone, and we'll both, like, without even saying anything, we'll both look at each other and, like, set the phone down. And, yeah. Like, <laughs> we've, we've been together for almost eight years, man, and we went – to uh, a restaurant one time we were both on our phones and then the waiter comes up and goes so guys first date and i looked <laughs> up at him and i was like sure you know like, let's go with this like you know what i mean like it, it just from like both of us being on our phone it looked like we were both like on a first date like shit what the hell do we say to this person but i'll show like, you my board if we... you show me yours yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, I'll show you less, my browser history if you show me yours. It's less about the social media, and for me, it's just as, as long as you give me something in a top ten list, I'm going to look at it. It's the ability <laughs> to have. It's the ability to have anything at the at the the tip of your finger. 
that's that's the main thing is like when you say I'm at a restaurant, you're having a conversation. You don't then just you don't have to describe something anymore because you can just say no physically. Look at it. This this is what yeah. it is. This is exactly what I'm describing. There you mm-hmm. go. Take it and yeah. and run with it. It really fucked up bar arguments though. I mean, bar arguments were yeah. unsolvable, like yep. huge mysteries of the universe that wouldn't basically go unsolved <laughs> for the rest of your life. Now some <laughs> asshole just pulls out their phone, looks it up, and the conversation's over. You're like, over. Yeah. Shut right. down. Yeah. Right. Just the know, earth isn't flat. Rest of your life. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> okay. you, you, you know why you one... never? The reason you never solve bar arguments is because you're too drunk to remember what you talked about until so the next day. You have no idea what the argument was. It was completely. That's why it was so unsolved. fucking inconsequential that you didn't give a shit anymore. <laughs> Yeah, bullshitters really ruled the day back then before Google on a phone. Oh, yeah. If you were oh, a class yeah. A bullshitter, you were the man. Nowadays, you always got that one person that's like, well, what does the Google say? You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And get the, on there. Like, just really <laughs> inconsequential. What was the name of Joey Butterfuco's, like, auto shop or something? You know, just some sort of crazy, obscure thing from the 90s. Yeah. Hot tires, by the way, in case you didn't know. I looked up <laughs> Joey Butterfuco a little while ago. Consequently, then got onto the girl that he was seeing, who's actually made adult films, and now is uh, she's met another guy and divorcing. Again, it's this kind of Wikipedia rabbit hole that you get down. I, I just jump from one person to the next person. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have a problem. I think we've come too far, like to go without the internet, and I can't stress enough about like how much it's even going to change and keep evolving. I mean, who? Who would have, you know, saw the invention of the very first telephone and said, you know, someday you're going to watch people have sex on that. You know what I mean? They would have never saw it coming. Where you know what I mean? I think, like, so. I think about that on every single product. Every single product I see that's ever invented, I think someday we're going to figure out how to watch fucking on that. Like, right. it's just, it's inevitable. Smart when we bridge. were kids, we used to read the cereal box like fucking savages. Soon, you'll just be able to watch porn on it. Yes. Your cereal? Yes. Yep. <laughs> The new iPad cereal box, like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, guys. The next topic for discussion is single player missed opportunities, and don't be too harsh on me if the games that I decided to talk about uh, were not ones that you'd like to see uh, with multiplayer a- additions. Let us know in the comments what you think about this topic. Have you ever played a single player only game, only to wish that there was more to it? Destiny 2 has been an awesome game so far, and while playing it, I asked myself what games of the past would have benefited from from an online mode, either versus or co-op. I think games like Horizon Zero Dawn, Hellblade, possibly Resident Evil 7, could have benefited from some form of online play. What games have you played that you think would have benefited from some type of online mode? This is specific. This isn't a single player game that you just wanted more content. Typically, a want single play- online play for a single player. Some type of online mode. I know. I have an answer already because I've already thought about this a million times. Um, for me, Elder Scrolls. <clears throat> and I'm not oh, talking about the crappy man. Elder Scrolls online game. I'm sorry if you guys enjoy that game. I'm a huge Elder Scrolls fan. I could not get into the MMO version. What I want is true Oblivion, true Skyrim, with the ability to link into your friend's world and have shared loot across the game. Me and my friend, yes. Yeah, like, so if you join my world, you pick up where I'm at in the game and my quest lines and things like that. And we can go do these quests together. We find a chest, it's got loot in it. Oh, you know, what? what's your class? You know, you know, you're an archer, you should definitely have this bow. You know, you're a magician, you should have the staff. I want that true, like, just vastness exploration of every single cave's got to be explored with a friend. And me and my cousin, Conman, would almost kind of replicate this as best as we could. Um, we would hop in a party and go do the same quests together on different games, and he would be exploring the cave and be like, hey, did you take the first left when you went in? There was a chest that had something interesting in it. And that was the closest we could get to that feeling. And I really want that, man. I want it to be true Skyrim, exactly how it is now, but with a friend there. That would be no, awesome, no, man. no gimmicky mods on PC. I want it to be done by, you know, Bethesda. <clears throat> and to me, that would be, that would probably be one of the, the end-all games. Same thing with me. Fallout, though, if you think yeah. about it. Fallout. I'm, imagine playing Fallout 3 or Fallout 4 
And, you know, a, a group of four going into that game, just as deep as it is now, nothing sugar-coated. You find the loot, you're playing together, you're going through the campaign. That would be unbelievable. Wow. Yeah, it would be not even necessarily four players. If I could even just get one more person in there with an amazing connection and, like, uh, no desync and, you know, whatever. Just If it could just be perfect and get another player in there. And I have been saying that since my first like 10 hours into oblivion when it came out on the uh xbox 360 oh really yeah i just uh, dude those oblivion to this day is probably one of i consider it a modern game it's Same old here but it's modern um that is probably my favorite modern game of all time the colors in that game and the exploration and you know you're just walking over a hill and all of a sudden some asshole jumps out of the bushes and throws a fireball at you you know what i mean it's it's really that cool. was the first like, that was the first uh, <laughs> that was the first elder scrolls game i played and that was the only game i bought the actual official strategy guide for that was like a fucking bible with the oblivion symbol on the front yeah. i still got it around Me here someplace too. that too. is that... one of my favorite games of all time yeah and all you time. have to you have for a game like that you have to have a physical book man i cannot stop and go look something up on the internet i have to have the book in front of me for a game like that but man, it would just be so much fun. Like, I have so many good memories in that game, you know? Like, getting addicted to Skuma for the first time was hilarious, you know what I mean? In the game. And, like, just some of the funny things. And if you can get into that, like, with a friend, you could turn like into a, a like vampire, a, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Or if a friend had an ailment and was paralyzed, and then all of a sudden, like, you got, you got to go on, like, a short quest to find some sort of, like, an ailment. And, you know, I just, I don't know. It'd be, it'd be next level to me. Yeah, it really would. Brian, Gary, any thoughts on any single player game that you've ever played? It could be from any generation that you think would have benefited from some. And don't say Super Mario World. Uh, I was just thinking about it because I have Gary's favorite controller in my hand. Thoughts, guys? So for me, um, what you guys describe, I I don't actually want to add multiplayer onto any of my games. Um, and that's because I'm an antisocial individual. No, it's not at all. Um, it's more about the fact that for me, I like um, a game that is designed and built from the ground up to be a, uh, a social experience and a game that is like multi-person. So I've played pr probably more MMOs than anyone here. Like I, I, I'm generally an MMO guy. That was what I played before shooters. Shooters, then heavily MMOs, then back to shooters. And what you described there about Skyrim and Oblivion, I love. I like the idea. You know, let's have a world where you can go in with people into Skyrim. But my point is, why don't you just have Skyrim world that everyone else in there is another person? And, and again, not the MMO that we ended up with, but a proper true MMO. So rather than just you and your buddy, you know, you've got you and your buddy are off fighting in a cave. And Beastly might be living with Kate in, you know, in, in, a, in a village somewhere, somewhere else, you know, going fighting stuff. Briar's off slaying dragons in the, in the valley down below. But we're all existing in a persistent world. And for me, you said, I, that, that is why I played MMOs, because they were kind of reaching towards that fantasy. And the closest that I got to that were things like Anarchy Online, which felt very close to that. The original Star Wars Galaxies was very, very close to that with player construction and housing. And whilst the MMO is kind of on a, on a downward spiral at the moment, what we're seeing is a resurgence of the sandbox survival MMO, which are, are looking to create this kind of world where players build it from the ground up, build the cities, build the um build the communities, build the, um, the the player waypoints on the map and actually populate it through themselves. So, yeah, for me, I think the single player, Horizon, for example, was a great game. I enjoyed playing it. Hellblade, I enjoyed playing it. Would I have enjoyed them more if they had an online component? Probably not. Um, same way Wolfenstein probably would have been good with a, a deathmatch mode, but it wouldn't have diminished my enjoyment of the game or didn't di diminish my enjoyment not to have it. And I think that games crafted from the ground up to be online generally do that better. Uh, that's my take. Well, so, what's the so name many... of the game you've been playing where you snap panties, Gary? Uh, Galgum. You wouldn't like to snap panties with a friend to the little... To be honest, you wouldn't want to be on team chat with me when I'm snapping panties. It's quite <laughs> uncomfortable. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so many, so many single-player games do add multiplayer components. I basically never even... Some fail at it, too. They try to add it like they think they have to. Mm -hmm. And it ends and up being a complete sad. flop. Yeah, and other time and resources could have been spent elsewhere. I'm going to stretch the this one because the game that I want to see function of is 
Uh, Google Earth VR. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you better not trip. Google Earth VR, I've maintained this so many times, is the best game on Oculus and Vive. It, calling it a game is, I think, stretching the definition of game. <laughs> <laughs> but what it is, for those who don't know what Google Earth VR is, it's basically you put on a VR headset and you have full access to Google Earth and you can fly around, you can go anywhere on the planet, and Google Maps is you know available to you in 3d like so like streets and cities are rendered in 3d so you can like you can fly into new york and stand uh below the statue of liberty or you can stand at the the tip of the torch on the statue of liberty then you can fly over to london and look at the you know the big the eye of london you can fly to by anywhere in the world and it's really a magical experience it's beautiful but there's no actual game to it right you're not you're not shooting anything you're just literally exploring and checking yeah. out beautiful places this week the, they added uh street view to it so now when you actually go down to the street level when you actually go down ground level it's going to be even more detailed than it was before the next step what i'd like to see have a game developer pull this in and allow you to play a multiplayer shooter anywhere in the world right and it can be paintball crazy. it can be paintball it doesn't have to be you know, real guns, it could be, you know, you know, like just friendly, you know, Mario style, like easygoing stuff, right? Splatoon stuff, yeah. 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 But goddamn, how fun would it be to be able to go anywhere in the world with your friends and play a multiplayer shoot? Like define your own play space anywhere in the world. Go to your old neighborhood where you grew up and where you used to play, you know, cops and robbers with your with your friends and actually play like a little bit of paintball or laser tag in that play space. Go to your neighborhood that you live in now. Go to you know, go to the Golden Gate Bridge and, you know, set up a game of capture the flag on the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, like the possibilities are literally like limitless too. Because you'd have the whole world as your playscape. I like that's that. That's the one I want. That's the one that's, I want. And I think it's I think it's you know, it's getting closer and closer to pop. That's going to happen, bro. That, that's, that's amazing. That that's a really good idea. And there's one problem with that though. Uh-huh. Everyone will just want to play on Nuketown, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's everyone will just again. want to play on we Nuketown. We got the whole goddamn world. You want to go to Nuketown <laughs> again? <laughs> just, you guys keep voting for Nuketown, man. Everyone Come loves on. Nuketown. The uh, there actually is a game with Google, um, like Earth Maps, and um, it's actually really genius. They load you into a random area, you have no idea where you are in the world, and a lot of people have been playing it with their Twitch chat. And you basically have to look around, look for signs, cars, license plates. Most of them are blurred out, or even what kind of people are there you know what i mean so you're looking around and every now and then you'll you'll see an image of like a random car driving down the road like when the google earth snapped the image you know there happened to be a car driving by yeah and you could be like that's an american car that's a european car so then you know what country you're in and it's actually a really fun game um there's the people the i can't remember what the hell it's called um but it's genius it's a lot of fun like you'll find like You'll figure out what state or province you're in, and then you'll you'll see a bridge, and you know you can actually move around within the Google Earth maps. So that you can have, okay, there's a bridge here, and up the road there's another bridge. I have to be right here, and the closer that you get to guessing your position is how many points you get, and they progressively get harder. And there's different categories and things like that. Not quite as cool as your idea, but still, it was. Pretty interesting. That sounds cool. I'd like. Well, to just keep your, your ear to the ground on Epic's nine one one YouTube channel, and, and he'll let us know if that ever happens, Briar, for sure. <laughs> Epic's nine one one. I recommended him to Briar a little while ago. Him, the Canadian guy, the VR guy. Unsubscribe to him. He's great. Yeah, he's an absolute true. legend. Um, yeah, I mean, you said that um, Google Earth VR is not a game as such, but to me, what is a game? A game is you, know, you can play Journey where there's there's nothing in it. You know, it's a relative narrative story that you're experiencing. You're playing it through. There's not shooting. There's not, you know. Um, puzzle solving in a conventional way for me what google earth vr does is give you the escapism that you just cannot get anywhere else and for me it's the fantasy there's nowhere else that i can actually have the power of superman so the way you described it and articulated that you can be in one position or another i think what what you need to convey is the fact that you are traveling there in real time so you'll be on the ground in new york and then you just point your arms up at the sky 
and you'll fly it into the air in real time. And so you, if you can got just... if you got vertigo or or yeah. uh, scared of I heights issues, this, stuff like that. It is it's... crazy. Like you walk to the edge of like a tall building, you're looking down. You will get like that. That sensation. You can crazy. stand on buildings. Yeah, yeah. you fly. Like you've got real time, so you can fly as Superman would. I could fly up into the air and stop around, look around me, fly down, fly into the side of buildings. I can go into like, you know, let's say the 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 Pentagon. You can go and land in the middle of the Pentagon and look around it there. You can fly up, you know, fly down the coastline of the Americas, look around That's it, get up. Yeah. You go into space and then look it's at where a, you want to go in Earth. And just zap down and land in the middle of like you That's know on London real Bridge. Superman experience. To right me, there. That, it's it's Google Earth. Yeah. It is just like using Google Earth, except that you have a VR headset on instead of looking at it. same exact experience. It's beautiful. It's so, really amazing. So could I put on a VR headset and fly over and look inside Gary's window? Is that possible? While he's <laughs> not snapping. Not panties. while I'm playing Galgun. You wouldn't want to see that. Okay. No one wants to see that. I, I don't even want to see myself sometimes. It's, it's, <laughs> okay. Good thought. Okay. I may have to check this out then. I may have to keep an eye on our little English muffin. Make sure he's not <laughs> the English muffin. You know. <laughs> That's a good idea, Brian. I think you may keep an eye on that, I'm, man. I'm so I happy think that may be the I future. Got you guys thoughts. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts on that. Next topic. No more I, arcades. Yeah, so this is kind of a weird transition, but it does kind of go to with what we were talking about with um, you know, like no internet. You know, could we survive? There was a time before the internet where social gaming was done at a place called an arcade. And what an <laughs> arcade was, was a building that housed awesome video games with their own monitor, joysticks, buttons, all this stuff. People would go pump quarters in, and it was the greatest time ever. It was the social gaming watering hole of sure the 90s was. and the 80s. Um, there's no more of them, man. And it's, it's really disappointing. And, like, it was such a magical experience growing up in the 80s and 90s when sometimes some of these games would get an arcade release before they'd get a console port. You know, I remember Mortal Kombat 2 being one of those. Mortal, and, Mortal Kombat! Yeah, yeah, right? And I just had such, like, great memories of, like, going to the arcade, throwing in a couple quarters, kicking ass of, you know, the kids that are twice my age at Mortal Kombat and staying on for practically, you know, a handful of quarters for the entire day. And, uh, man, it was just so much so much fun. And there's, I, I feel like that experience is gone. If you go to an arcade nowadays, you know, like they're generally like very cheap, chintzy, gimmicky games that, yep. you know. Basketball you, and... You know, there might be a, a Galaga machine tucked away in the corner with you know four inches of dust on it but you know like all the other games and that's the one that should be getting played you know mm -hmm. but like there's just there's there's no more arcades anymore and it's like unless you live in like i think it's uh massachusetts fun spot i don't know if you guys have heard of that is that is it yeah, massachusetts yeah. yeah fun spot they it's like the biggest arcade in the country you know what i mean and they have tons of arcade machines there and i actually have a really good friend um I'm actually going to shout him out because you guys should check him out too. His uh, YouTube channel is called Arcade Impossible. And he goes all over the Midwest and gets in contact with people with different machines and <clears throat> basically shows you that if you put a little time and effort into it that, you know, you don't have to spend $1,000 on these machines. And the last time I asked him how many machines that he had in his basement, he was approaching the, the, approaching the 30 plus range of different arcade Damn. cabinets in his basement. He said it's about comparable to running like a hot tub as far as the electric bill goes. So you don't have him running all, all the time. Yeah, you don't have him running all the time. You know what I mean? Like he'll do like parties and stuff and he has them on like certain breakers so he can turn certain sections on. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, but dude, he's got it all, man. He's got X-Men, he uh, The Simpsons. He's got the turtles. and He's oh, got When I was a single these. man, I really, really was looking hard for, remember those sit down cabinets they used to have at Pizza? Pac-Man. Yeah, the cocktail tables. Top. Yeah, the cocktail table. Yeah. I wanted mm -hmm. one of those in my kitchen as like a little dinette so bad. So I couldn't <laughs> find one. I couldn't find one. Oh, man. Yeah, but yeah. like I, I had a really great – and I, I cannot remember the name of this game for the life of me, but that's not the important part. The, the important part of the story I'm about to tell is there was an arcade machine that had a game that was very cryptic. 
very cryptic. I mean, it could be as cryptic as run around the room counterclockwise six times, then clockwise once and back and forth. So nobody knew how to beat this game. So eventually one day a random notebook was sitting on the, the machine. We opened it up and it told you how to beat the first level. So we did it. And then we figured out how to beat the second level. So we wrote that down in there. And progressively, as time had gone on, nice. people, who, people who had never met each other, never Leaving conversed, in the book. figured out how to beat these levels and just wrote it down on a notebook and put it on top of the machine. And you're not going to find that anymore because it goes back to what we were saying about the internet. internet. With, just whip out your phone and see what the Google has to say about it. <laughs> and but that's still, that activity still happens. It's on a massive scale. Like... True. Uh, Fez was very much what you're describing, right? Is people trying to uncover all the secrets of Fez. We've seen it in Destiny with, you know, Outbreak Prime quests and stuff like that, where, you know, it happens quick, but it's happening, and you you definitely can get involved in it. You gotta be there for such hours. But yeah, same, definitely. Same activity still no, happens. It's just happening on that instead of notebook. You're absolutely right, and that's totally cool. Like, I honestly, that had, like, slipped my mind. That So that's cool that you had brought that to light. But I guess, like, <clears throat> do you guys, like, remember the old school, like, awesome arcade feeling of a handful of quarters and going in just ready to play every game? And, like, what yeah. was some I remember of being greatest... a kid, right? Walking in, and you know, they're always kind of dark, and there was always yeah. the big kids there, like the teenagers, and you know, <laughs> you're a little kid, and you want to play that Street Fighter too, so you... You, you know, you kind of like you learn the the the, etiquette. the rule, yeah, the etiquette to put that quarter up on the machine and kind of mm -hmm. wait your turn, and then it's your turn, and you know you've been practic practicing Street Fighter Two at home on the Super NES, so you get a lot of time into it, and you actually, you know, you, maybe you do really good, maybe you do really bad. New games come in, and like maybe you're playing some Tekken, maybe you're playing like they had Outrun with. Know, like the full car or Sega Rally, yeah. or, you know, they had all sorts of like Jurassic the big Park. arcade cabinets. You know, what was the one with the motorcycle that leaned over and stuff? Moto, oh, yeah, Moto GP. they were cool, man. They were, they were a lot of fun. They still have Dave and Buster's. Do you guys ever, yes, they Dave do. And Buster's There's one here, yeah. I've never been Buster's. to one, though. No. It's awesome, it's like an adult arcade. Like they have a bar, and some of them have laser tag in them, and they laser have like arcades, arcades, yeah. Yeah. You can have a nice meal. I don't have, have one meal. close to me either. There was supposed to be one that opened up nearby, but they ended up not not coming. But when I go to uh, Philadelphia to visit my dad, there's one over there and it's a pretty cool experience. They have a, they have alcohol and video games and that's you know two of my favorite things. <laughs> drop the I'm kinda in the interested to, to see what the uh what was the arcade scene like uh across the pond, Gary, back in the day. So Back in the day, uh, there used to be more. So London, we had something called the Trocadero, um, which was like a big multi-story arcade in London. Um, shut down a few years ago because it was just basically mm. um, sort of Chinese knocked off items, stands, um, someone trying to sell fish that will eat like sort of growths on your feet, I guess. I don't know what it was. Happy feet, I think. Some <laughs> shit. Um, and then just like homeless people. Um, so they kind of shut that down. But um, Hugo mentioned it. If you go to like seaside resorts, so I had coastal resorts you get arcades but they're not they're not real arcades they're like they've got the the, um, the coin machines you know the coin dozers where they like sweep coins oh, yeah. back and forward and yeah um little, the grab a grab an animal machines you know where the, the, the little claw comes down so we've got those all over the the coasts but mm. not nothing that's that's a true um gaming area the problem with the uk i guess is that it's such a smaller um population you know our entire population now is still less than some of your like cities or definitely less than your states um the larger places so in the uk if you weren't in like london manchester birmingham or like you know in scotland maybe edinburgh or glasgow you're in the sticks you know you, you really did have nothing there whatsoever um it's getting a bit better now but for the uk um it really is more of a regional thing you know it's difficult to get a gauge on it because when I come to America, you guys have like the best nerd culture and geek. You obviously can tell from my my hoodie. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you've got you've got stores and things everywhere that serve that. You know, in the UK, we we really didn't have that. I think the biggest thing that the UK had was like the Warhammer Figures Games Workshop. Mm. Like that was big. Um, started in the UK and that went, that went global. But in terms of gaming, no, very very limited and insular, and even more so now. Mm. 
So you had you had named your local arcade, Gary. Mine was called <clears throat> Aladdin's Castle. Um, yeah, we had those at, too. Yeah, it was at my local mall. Um, I didn't realize. I was called re- Tons of Fun. Also, the name of my was first it? girlfriend. Oh, oh that's, that's mine awesome. was two Tons of Fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I got a question for you guys. Like, what what game? Like, what was like? one of your favorite games going back to like, or one of your greatest memories. Like I had kind of said like one of my greatest memories was, um, Mortal Kombat that game. Well, the game where the people had left the notebook on top where yeah. everyone eventually collectively beat the game. But, um, you gotta find out what fi- that game was and see if it's available. I'm in ha- yeah. I'm going to have to figure it out. I'll have to ask, uh, <clears throat> my buddy at arcade impossible. If he possibly knows what I'm talking about. But one of my favorite ones was the, the X-Men, uh, beat em up. The four player. We had a mm-hmm. birthday party. My mom took me to Aladdin's castle, gave me and my friends this big, big cup full of tokens. And the first one we went to was that uh, to the X Men game. And it was one of the first times. Actually, I think it was the first time <clears throat> that me and four friends kind of all looked at each other and were like, "We're gonna beat this, this game. <clears throat> we're gonna beat this game." And you know, just just popping them quarters in. You know what I mean? And it was it was awesome. And I'll probably remember that for the rest of my life. That was a good feeling when we all did that. Like. The, the first time I experienced that was with Ninja Turtles. And, Briar, you can probably attest to that. It was one of the earlier awesome. games. I think it was early, late 80s, early 90s when that, that uh, game came out. And it was just amazing. It was the first time we'd ever experienced that kind Same of visceral kind of activity. X-Men game, right? X-Men is very Kinda similar. I think Konami yeah, both developed those? Yep, Konami yeah. made them both. Yep. But, but but before I give you my, my favorite game, I wanted to elaborate on this whole topic just a, just a little bit if I can. This is actually our own creation. This is what we've been asking for. Uh, And anytime you think of the past, even though it may have been shitty, it's always the good old days. For us now, you think about being a kid, you may have been going through things, but you say, wow, it was a good old days because there's always something good to remember about it. I remember a term, and I'm sure you guys remember it uh, in the 90s that everybody was looking for when it came to gaming. And that that term was arcade perfect. Arcade perfect was a big deal in the 90s when games started coming out. Super Nintendo had... Mortal Kombat 2 and Super Street Fighter 2, Turbo, and all this stuff was coming out. And that term, Arcade Perfect, meant so much to gamers. And when we think about it, when we look back to it, Arcade Perfect was, if you had an Arcade Perfect rendition of a game, you didn't have to go to the arcade anymore. I remember when Mortal Kombat 3 came out on PlayStation 1. I disagree. And I'll tell you why. Because I got, I, I, I went to the arcade for years for fighting games. I, I think the rise and fall of you know, the fighting game happened at the arcades. And yes, you could get a really cool version of Street Fighter 2 on Super Nintendo or Mortal Kombat or Tekken when the PlayStation came out. But the place to play that game was at the arcade. Uh, and that, you know, right into college, we had we had arcade cabinets in our you know, social space in our college. And it was, even then, it was still like, let's, you can play in your dorm room Practice in your dorm room, but you go you go to the stand up cabinet to test your skills against everybody else. Well, that was this, fun. I can agree with you there, uh, but I still disagree with you personally because it's subjective. See what we did when when these games came out, like Mortal Kombat three for PlayStation One's probably the first real example I ever had of something that was on the cusp of arcade perfection, barring loading times. It was a perfect gameplay rendition of the arcade. We bought the PlayStation One arcade stick. So we actually had that at home and all my friends came over. We didn't have to waste our money at the arcade anymore. And it became, that became the new hangout spot. Yeah. You know, but it, it, all of a sudden it's just your friends as opposed to the public. Those, right? but like those are, but, the but when we went to the, you've dwindled the competition down instead of being open to, you know, who just, whoever walked up to that fucking arcade machine. Yeah. Might've I mean, been but, a scrub but, but might've been out. the best player you ever saw. Check yeah. it out. You knew See, all your friends. You probably, you had all your friends ranked, right? You knew who was good, who wasn't. You knew well, the moves, arcade machine. Character. You had no idea well, who was walking up to let, that machine. Let me explain. Yeah. Let me explain. I grew up with some of the best uh, fighting game uh, players in the world. Uh, Akmal Griffith, who's known as Sid Kid in, in uh, the tournament world, who's gone to different countries to play these games. He, we grew up across the street from one another, and we played these games. I tell you guys I'm good at fighting games. I used to challenge people in our old show. Nobody would ever show up. Um that's what we did. We challenged the best people. Nobody has and a Yobo, man. We don't can't connect to you. <laughs> but, but this is the same thing that we've been asking for in other aspects of life too. Like we say, we're, arcade. Perfect. We don't want to pay that twenty dollars a month for Yobo Live. Yobo Live. <laughs> I heard only, it's peer to peer too. Nineteen ninety nine US. <laughs> yeah, no, it's tick right. 
But yeah, um, it's a great, for, for just... us, Briar, uh, Gary Wilson, our house at nighttime, my dad just gave it away. You know, he'd go to his room. It was me, my brother, and five or six of our friends. And it would be me and Lewis and Akmal and Damien, rest his soul. And, and, and some of our other friends, D, they'd all be over if we play these games to the wee hours of night. I'm talking about people who actually knew infinites, you know, infinite combos. We do Marvel versus yeah. Capcom. We were animals. And that's how we got good in these kind of games. And it negated the need for us to go out and waste more money in the arcade, especially when things like the Dreamcast came out. Dreamcast, Marvel versus Capcom 2, arcade perfect. No need to go to the arcade. Fighting games died when, to me, for me, when they moved online. When when the preferred way to play it was online, and I couldn't I couldn't literally bitch slap the person who just beat me <laughs> in the game. Yeah, I was yeah, so mad that I'd cool. reach over. Bah! Yeah. <laughs> like I couldn't reach over and It didn't matter if it was controller. on the couch and it was my best friend it or was it was somebody I hardly up. even knew standing next to me at a Street Fighter machine. Man, like it, the the appeal of fighting games just absolutely died for me as soon as the person I was playing against was no longer standing. Well, look, check it out. You didn't punch people you didn't know in the arcade when they beat you. So that's just nitpicking. Uh, I mean, for me, <laughs> God damn it. it's questionable. Look, Not hard. For, for, for me, uh, for a while, that did kind of die off because I moved away from my friends and my family. Nobody really saw each other. I went up north for a few years. And so whenever I get a game and it had an online functionality, yeah. Four, five, six years ago, that online functionality was lacking, and you would get all kinds of latency. And so for me, that was a real issue. That is kind of tapered off at this point. Now games like Tekken 7, I get no latency. I'd love it if you guys got I'd love it if someone in the comment section bought that game and challenged me, and I put it on my YouTube channel. How about that? But um, now it's kind of gone away. Now it's like when you play people online, it's almost a one-to-one -one representation of the same feel you would get at an arcade cabinet playing someone right next to you. You don't uh, get that the same. I don't. I don't. I don't see them. I don't feel them. Like they're not like, there with me. It might as well just be a computer. I'm fighting. Like in the fighting game it's genre, it just never felt the same. As soon as like the people you were fighting against were like right next to you. disappeared. Yeah, when they disappeared, you didn't like it anymore. It's but you're fine with playing Destiny and not seeing people. What's like, that? Going into the crucible and fight, fight going. I don't know. For some know? reason, for a shooter, it's different. Uh, than with a fighting game where it was a much more personal thing because it's a one-on-one -on -one fight. You know, like when I was a kid and I wrestled, I found I found much more competition in wrestling than I did in team sport because it was a one-on-one -on -one fight. There's nobody you could blame if you lost but yourself. And there's you know there's nobody who could take credit for your win but yourself. So you know, I just when I was a kid, I really liked you know I didn't like team sports. I liked wrestling. I didn't like you know. I, Shooters weren't a thing, really. I mean, Doom came yeah, out later, but totally multiplayer, you know, like co competitive gaming was fighting games, basically. And it was a one-on-one -on -one thing, you know? Wish I could have met you back then, Briar, in an arcade. It would have been a fucking battle. <laughs> it would have been, been a war. I was never that good. I just really enjoyed it, you know? Yeah. Did I you like ever get into like, like Marvel vs. Capcom 2, Briar? Huh. God, you missed an arcade sensation, man. I was in the arcade for that. Before it came to Dreamcast... I was losing my mind. Oh my I was, goodness! I, w I went from Street Fighter to uh, Street Fighter Two Turbo. I kind of skipped Super Street Fighter because it was it felt like a step the same back thing. Turbo, uh, yeah. and then Tekken and Virtual Fighter, and then I kind of I stepped away from Virtual Fighter. I kept going with Tekken. Tekken's and a better game. Eventually, I think with Tekken Two, I basically stopped. Tekken Three, you missed it, man. That was a renaissance. Oh, There's no man. arcade with Tekken Three in it. That's why I missed it. There was an arcade of Tekken 3. What are you talking about? <laughs> Not near me, it wasn't. I oh, said okay. arcade near me with Tekken 3. Oh, yeah. So, <sighs> for me, I was never much of a, an arcade guy, as you can tell, or a fighter guy. But I do have my first memory of playing a game in a, a kind of an arcade setting. And I must have been about five or six, I'm going to say. Um, and we were in the store. And I remember distinctly, it was a pre-release version, because they used to have them back then, like demo versions of the game. Yeah. Of... Jurassic Park for the Sega Genesis, um, where you could play as like the Raptor or the, uh, the, the little guy on a boat, and like a T Rex would come out and like attack the boat or whatever. Anyway, that was the game, and I was there with my mum and just me and her, and uh, she said, "Right, we're going to go home now. It's a long drive. Um, do we need to use the bathroom now or or not? Because you know I'm gonna I'm going, so you can either stay here and play this or use the bathroom." And I tell you what, I had, uh, I, you know, I knew that I was going to lose like 
five minutes of gaming time, potentially going to the bathroom. I know I entered the store with dry pants. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I might not have left with them. But that story stuck in my head, man. Jurassic Park was that good to me that I literally pissed myself to play it for five minutes longer in the store. Jurassic Park, Sega Genesis. Yeah, you man. Come to, when next time you come to the stage, just swing by here. We'll play it together. I my mother used to a, a knockoff uh, Sega Genesis, though. I'll bring my mother used pants. to do tennis once a week. I used to have to like, basically sit in the lobby at the tennis place, and they had a, uh, they had a joust machine. And I spent hours on that joust oh, machine. Oh, man, it was so good. I love that machine. I, I would just spend hours and hours there because you know I was just sitting there waiting for my mother to get done with her tennis. So I'd just be, I was just. It's it's I was, a lot well, of fun. It's a lot yeah, of fun now when you get friends together and have drinks and do it because that's what my buddy yeah. does. Is he'll do um, what is it like meetup or something like that? He'll do like an online meetup. He'll Sounds just like kinky. post it out and just have an open basement party. Nice. Just you know friends, friends strangers, you, whatever. Friends he'll he'll. Yeah. He's uh he is dude. He's what's he's the name the of that man. channel? It's Arcade Impossible on YouTube. Check it out. He's a good guy. He does some funny. He does some funny stuff on there. But uh, real quick to answer your question, Wilson, uh, the game that I played the most as a as a young man that meant the most to me and me and my brother would spend hours playing it was uh, Alien vs Predator, the arcade mm -hmm. game. Uh, it was a four player uh, experience as well, and they also had a two player cabinet. Had incredible music, two humans and two predators destroying these aliens and i still play it to this day i play it on emulators and whatnot and there was an arcade game that had me befuddled for years it would cost a dollar to play i put my money in and lose it and and wonder how i lost it because i didn't understand the dynamic of the game and that was fucking dragon's lair i'm done that game was fucking terrible <laughs> that game was wasn't <laughs> it on like a um <clears throat> See, i'm pretty sure my um, yeah i was saying, i'm pretty sure my buddy has that it's on I, a laser on disc PS3. and that was one of the that's one of the like Biggest things that go out on those machines nowadays is those laser discs. And there's people that actually manufacture laser discs specifically for that game because it's such a common problem that when you get that cabinet, that that laser disc machine just doesn't work and you can't play the game. <clears throat> that game was a cool concept, but you were basically paying to watch a short That's Disney true. film. A yeah. short Disney film. With basically. quick time events. Yeah the, yeah, the animations were beautiful and stuff like that. I never that. got past the very first. <laughs> Quick time event. I was a bought that in the Steam that? sale for like sixty cents a couple of weeks ago. Actually, and now that you re recognize the name, I've never no intention to play it. I, I buy games because I see them cheap in the Steam sale. But thank you for hooking me up with that Steam sale last week too, Gary. Have you looked at those animates yet? Yes, I have. <laughs> thank me later, brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, are we out of That's topics? Great. Is that it? We've got one to close, I believe. Get it. It's yours. I believe it's yours. <laughs> what was it? it it's, it's the, uh, is there one actor working today oh. that when you see them in a movie or TV show, it becomes an automatic must watch? Oh, I mean, you guys shit. have an actor like this, like a favorite actor or actress? I, I don't know. Am I supposed to say actress anymore? Is everybody an actor? You know? I think they're all actors. Think they're actress all actors. diminishes them. No. Okay. They're actresses. Actor. Yeah. We're going with actor because. Actor. That's so, why I used to call. What do you guys Hector. think? Is there any? Uh, is there somebody out there like that? I know, like when I was younger, Kevin Spacey was big, but he's kind of he's falling still one off. Of my favorites. Um, with House of Cards, he's coming, kind of come back, but there's a while there where he he was in some stinkers. <laughs> As a kid, it was Chris Farley all day. Ah, if it had Chris Farley in it. I was watching it. That dude was my hero growing up, and it's still somebody that, even though he's passed away, that I still look up to and think was an awesome individual. As I got a little bit older, the first time I saw Forrest Gump, I wanted to watch everything with Tom Hanks in it. I really That's like his still work. still paying I, benefits, too. Yeah, anytime Forrest Gump is on, you sit down and watch it. doesn't matter if you missed 10 minutes. doesn't matter if you missed the first hour of it. Yes. And I sit down and I watch the rest of it because that movie's awesome. And he's he's got some other really good movies. Like I, as a kid, he was in a movie called The Burbs. I don't know if yeah. you guys have seen yeah. that, oh, where he yeah. thinks his neighbors are murderers family. and yeah. he's trying to prove it. That shit was so good. And then you know, Cast Away Wilson, my boy's in it. You know, I gotta you know. So yeah, mm -hmm. I love Tom Hanks, man. He's awesome. He's awesome. Yeah, good movies. Okay, for me, 
I'm gonna. This is off the cuff. There's two, and I like them both a lot. Oh, yeah, I, I love. The God damn it, bro! I'm I'm bending the rules like you oh, bent the rules on mine. It's the rule. It's God one after. It. <laughs> Pick one. It's uh, the fun of it. You have to. You have to select one. The <laughs> one I'm gonna select then, since Briar is being biased here and not letting me bend the shit. I'm just playing by the rules. Oh, that's bullshit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is Idris Elba? Uh, oh, and he was recently. He was recently in uh, the very horrible Stephen King adaptation of yeah, um, uh, The Dark Tower, which I never read the books, but James Bond. that's what I'm hearing. And that he'd be great at it. Is it, is it uh, real? The, it's, it's been out in the ether for a long time. The reason I like Idris Elba is because I've watched him go from being, you know, just a, a side actor and being a no one in films uh, to, to taking the lead. And one of my favorite shows is a, a BBC show called Luther. Uh, I watched all the episodes of that. He's so talented uh, as a character actor, and uh, he was in my favorite TV show of all time, The Office, for a while. Uh, oh, that's and right. I, just, I forgot he was in that. He sure was. Charles TV. Minor. His name was Charles Minor. The the, the, and, the fake one, not the real office. Is that right? Right. Yeah, the we're talking one. about the, we're, we're talking, talking about, about the, the funny, funny one, one. <laughs> with, with Steve Carell. Oh, the one that took all the the original ideas and then dragged the it out that, for like the forty-five one who had a, seasons or so. Yes, the one who had an attractive one. Pam and a funny Dwight. Right. <laughs> The American one. And people the with other. teeth. Yeah, look, I've been watching that show, the whole show, at least 10 times, all through, like, all eight seasons. I don't Just play when it comes the, to the office. The British one, you've got 12 episodes, the entire show I watched comes that at it. least three or four times. Conclusion. Yeah. Uh, Ricky Gervais, he started something great, but I think Stephen, Steve Carell finished it and made it into the phenomena we know it as today. But, yeah, I just elbow was Charles Minor, I think, in, episode, in, in season five. And uh, he played a great role there. And I, anything he does, I like to see him in all the superhero movies. He's in Thor. And uh, he's just a great actor to me. So I'll follow him wherever he That's goes. That's a good pick. That's a good pick. Thank you. Gary, you got one? Yeah, so for me, I think it probably says more about me than anything else. Um, <laughs> in terms of who I pick, I kind of pick them just not because they're a good actor or because, again, the films they do are anything good. But it's just because I like their face. Um and that's James Franco, right? So James Franco, to me, he just has a likable face. I look at him and I think... <laughs> I'm not going to lie, Gary. Man. You look a little bit like James oh, Franco. Yeah. <laughs> when, I'm wondering. I'm glad you said that because I wanted to interject there and be like, I'm this wondering. son of a bitch. <laughs> you just like to see yourself in movies. Now, oh, <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's so it's the same <laughs> Again, it, I think it's just I, I think I'm just repressing some some deep homosexual feelings here because it's the same with Paul Rudd. Again, repressed. I don't care what Paul Rudd's in. If I see Paul Rudd's face in a film, I just want to touch it. Paul um, and that's face. like, yeah, Paul Rudd, James Franco. Again, so you like attractive men? Well, okay, we got you, Gary. Well, again, have you ever watched a James Franco film and not been fully entertained? I've been entertained, not so. for the same think... reasons, but, you know, I've been entertained. I think he's a likable face. Pineapple yeah. Express is great. Yeah, dude, are you Express kidding me? What is the one where he's, he got That's his arm favorites. caught? Say what? Yeah, 100, 127 hours was not his high yeah, point. I mean, seeing him in a, in a ditch for a while was not great, but he followed I thought up he, with he was interview. good in it, though. Like, he pulled it off. Harry, He was Harry Osborn, too, in, in the, you know, Spider-Man. Yeah. I mean, definitely, just... definitely is, the high point of his career was Pineapple Express. Yeah. No, yeah, the, yeah, the interview yeah, no. with Seth Rogen and Kim Jong. Are you kidding me? I haven't that seen that. Such a good film. They made it for free. It, it was it's like pretty good, man. It's like, so good. It became free to, to play when out. they made it for free. I was like, free to play, free to watch. The Keep best that part shit. about that movie was before it even got started that they were interviewing Eminem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like talking about coming out as, as gay. It's like, yeah, it was a, a metaphor for my gayness. And so, yeah, it's so good. <laughs> so good. Like... It, oh, it's just funny. a really, I, again, I. I'm not into like he did a film recently with Brian Cranston as well called um uh what's it called something about oh, is it oh, him yeah. or yeah why him or something like why that why him or oh, anyone yeah. but him is that good it was again it's it's a uh, it's a film with James Franco so all of them <laughs> that's, have a, that's it <laughs> they're of a theme again, or I don't or you could them. refer to it as a film with a guy that looks like Gary Diaz <laughs> yeah, like, Gary Diaz's body that's double so that's it. He, I just I like double. his stuff. He was in the end as well. Again, it, it's oh, the yeah, Seth yeah. Rogen yeah. kind Spring of. Spring Breakers yeah. was he in that? Was that him? Yes, he had the gold teeth and the cornrows. Yeah, yeah, that that was him on the. That was his like his rough side again. I I, I like that. Um, 
Yeah. Just, again, anything with James Franco. I, I just, I think this is probably the post. If I take this down, it's just a shrine of James Franco behind me. I probably shouldn't do that. Wow. But yeah. I knew you were too handsome to, to do the work that you do. I knew that you were someone's <laughs> body double or stunt double in a movie. Figured it out. He wouldn't get hired with that sweater on as a stunt double. I don't know, man. You put some long hair on him, dude. He could throw him on a set of Pineapple Express. No Hell yeah, problem. he could be a movie star. Put a Easy. joint in his hand, grow some hair out. And he, it's <laughs> just good you. good quality stuff. Again, I don't, I don't like to... Some people like really serious films. Like I know basically like horror films... And, you know, you like that kind of thing. For me, I just like things um, that just make me smile. And question, question. for me, his face on, makes on, me smile. On the topic of that, Gary, have you ever seen Shaun of the Dead? And what did you think about it if you have? I have. I've seen the entire Cornetto trilogy. So um, that one, yeah, The man. End, and Hot Fuzz. Hot um, Fuzz. And I really like everything that, that Simon Pegg and uh, is it Nick? What's his name? Nick something or other. Anyway the other dude um do as, as a thing so Shaun of the dead to me wasn't a horror film it was a comedy film set around zombies um so if it was a, a horror film first with comedy elements i wouldn't have enjoyed it so i think what was it called uh there was a film with sam raimi drag me to the grave bring me drag to the me grave to hell. Drag me oh to yeah hell, which was drag like a horror hell. comedy and, and that was on and i watched it just because it was there and i didn't enjoy that in the slightest but then the other way around a comedy with zombies i'll watch it i, I felt like they met somewhere perfectly in the middle because there were genuine parts of Shaun of the Dead that scared the shit out of me. But there were so many other what? aspects that had me... What parts? It, <laughs> I'm not kidding, so. man. There are certain aspects of that, that film, the way that these, these She's creatures like, There's acted. so many fucking white people around here. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Come on, man. You know I get along great with white people. I know you do. I'm just making a joke. Probably <laughs> one in poor taste. They all to like show up. But funny, Let me though. call and make a reservation. <laughs> then I show up and I said, do you have a reservation for Beastly? Is it, is it you, sir? Said, yes, it is. Thought you were someone else. Right this way. <laughs> <laughs> Why is everyone British in your skits? I don't know. I just like doing it. I think about you all the time, Gary. I know, man. I know. I think we've, we've bonded. Yeah. I can think about you even more now that you look like James Franco. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even... <laughs> clock that i just as i said he's there's something about him whenever i see him on the tv i'm instantly in a better mood you know it's, wow. it's, it's like you know you say it's oh, love when cool. that person comes into your life and you yeah. feel you yeah. know that sense of completion I, I have that with james franco i, I feel that when I, when I see you guys honestly i promise i'm not even being facetious thank you, I love you and some fucking devils so i pick and i'm gonna get a lot of hate for this one but it's nathan fillion Nice. Like, I no. love seeing really? this guy in everything he does. I don't care if it's in Modern Family, if it's in Destiny, if it's in Firefly, if yeah. it's in Castle, if it's in Doctor whatever his name was, Sing Along Blog. <laughs> like it doesn't matter what this guy is, and he can't even act, as far as I can tell. He always plays the same fucking character, but I don't care because I love the character. When I see this guy on screen, when I hear this guy's name, I want good things for this person. Because I'll just like him. <laughs> do you think he? Do you think he would have made a good Nathan Drake? Is a is a the good, best question. If he was younger, I think so. Yeah. But Nathan yeah. Drake is old as hell now, isn't he? Yeah. yeah, you're probably right. Yeah, I love the guy. I was gonna say David Tennant, but man, it in my heart, it's Nathan Fillion. <laughs> I fucking wow. love the guy. I, this is just like just a real man love episode, isn't it? Really? It is. You know, just it is. No, yeah, but it is now. You just made me realize something that, like, you said you see him on screen and you just want good things for him. Yeah. Jeff Bridges, man. Yeah. But, oh, you know nice. what I mean? Like, that's yeah. the perfect yeah, example. Bridges, like, man. I am going to be the dude, like, 15, 20 <laughs> years from now. That is going to be me going yeah. to the local market store, writing a check for a carton of milk. I aspire you know, to my... be the dude. I aspire yeah. to live a life free of stress like the dude does, right? Like, that's yeah. the beauty of the dude, in my opinion. It's like, uh, he I... just floats through life he flows through life like water down the stream right <laughs> there's rocks in the way and he just flows right around them <laughs> Fucking yeah. i actually i feel that way about woody harrelson whenever i see him on tv yes uh it, it lifts my day he's the star of one of my greatest favorite films of all time which is a comedy called kingpin and i fell in love with him as an actor during that film and everything that he's in i have to see it that would have been my number pick. two yeah, and he's got guy. range, though. That guy can act. Yes, he does. Yeah. Like, he's, he's in all else. sorts of good stuff. 
Yeah. I feel like that you do get that feeling, though, like you said about good feelings or other feelings there from certain actors. So I got a feeling as well that I just wish this particular actor was my dad. And not just this particular guy, but just like him in this role as well. Mm. And Guardians of the Galaxy 2, Kurt Russell. When he came out yes. and he was eager, I was like, can he just be my dad? Can I just <laughs> go and live with him on that planet? Because he's just like the most warm infectious smile like, a bit like you actually Bri there um yeah not saying you're my dad there because obviously kurt russell's a lot older man but <laughs> you know that kind of bearded loving you know it's why you know that warm, he was asking like, his son to like destroy everything right would you not at the beginning not right at the beginning he was just kind oh, of you mean, oh, yeah, yeah, he was young at the beginning okay. spoiler spoilers. fucking beastly spoilers. spoiler spoilers. Damn god it. damn if you haven't seen that fucking movie you done fucked up in the same no, movie, something. Chris Pratt. I fucking love Chris Pratt. Yeah, yes. like, that's Kate's favorite. Going yeah. through like right when I first saw him in Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec. Like I fucking love this guy. Like he just plays the innocent. Talk yeah. about range, though. Guy, so True good. story. Yeah. He was meant to be only on the first season of Parks and Rec. So if you look at his character in the first season, yeah. he's really meant to be an antihero. You know, that's holding. Um, who was the girlfriend name? in it? Yeah, I can't remember her name. Whoever it is, anyway, the girl he's with at the time, from the really office, yeah. holding her back throughout the first um, season, the, the, the um, Quincy Jones, um, Quincy Jones' daughter, yeah. Daughter. Anyway, he's holding her back, and he was meant to be this like drifter kind of boyfriend with with the broken legs that was gone, and he was so likable, like you said, everyone responded to him so well that they wrote him as a a kind of a you know a protagonist and someone that people could get behind in moving forward there that that's how much he's like is that he completely changed the character and kept <laughs> you, him in there. you had mentioned uh kurt russell man have you have you seen big trouble in little china oh that is his God. best God, role on. ever man that is such a good movie and there was actually a local movie theater um they don't do it anymore man but they were showing movies from like the 80s and they're remaking that big trouble in little china was one of them and that's like me Con Man and Great's like one of our favorite movies of all time. We reference awesome. it all the time. And fortunately, Great lives on the other side of the country, so he couldn't make it. But me and Con Man got to go to the movie theater, nice. and it was full of other diehards who were quoting, you know, the little <laughs> quotes in the movies and stuff. So it, it was just absolutely perfect. And I figure I should point out that uh, Peanut Kate said, "Wow, what a sausage fest!" In chat with us. <laughs> That's what we come here for. I mean, I actually went through a Kurt Russell um, like marathon the other day. Um, it was about a month ago they had a Kurt Russell marathon on. And I'll tell you what, he was awesome in Overboard. That film was so good with Goldie Horn. Have you ever seen that? Or is it just me? No, I've seen it. I love that movie. Love that movie. Kurt Russell's Again, yeah, he's he, he was an actor. Wild actor. Was he really? I thought, was a, I thought it was back. a carpenter. Maybe I'm thinking or was somebody that, else? I know that Harrison Ford was a carpenter as well. Harrison Ford was, yeah. And I thought it was Kurt Russell. I, I only... thought Kurt Russell was in. Kurt Might Russell. be. Let's get on the internet. IMDb. The no, internet. See that... Let's, Let's see what the Google has to say. We can talk about it for the next 10 <laughs> minutes or we can look it up and have nothing to say to each other. <laughs> Let me just clarify for, for thing. Sorry, I'll have clarify to get off the James Franco real... tabs that I've got open, mate. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I want to clarify something for Peanut Kate. I only chose men because you're the only woman I love. Lame. Yeah. I got haters in here, baby. I got haters in here. Is that the best you got? I ain't got to say shit. She's going to love me regardless. So fuck all of y'all. Shit. Was she on there when you were talking about the anime titties or did she miss that bit? She was there. She was watching. I I need her for backup. She has to, to verify that they are adequate breasts. Yeah. That's that's what a relationship is all about, Gary. Give and take. You got to be support. Okay, I'm, I'm there watching her when she's breastfeeding, making sure nothing suffocates my daughter. Shit. All right, um, that guys, just got I creepy go to bed. real quick. Go to bed. Go to bed. <laughs> How many hours have you been awake, Brian? I don't know. Twenty. Man. Twenty out of twenty-four. <laughs> It is, it is bedtime for this guy right here. Maybe you should start your own TV show and you can be our favorite actor in the new episode, the new season of 24. And it'll be 24 hours of Briar playing Destiny. <laughs> I'd watch it. <laughs> I did go to a couple photo shoots. Was that a photo shoot? <laughs> oh, man. Well, I don't know about you guys. I'm going to go off and IMDB James Franco for the rest of the evening. But... Um... <laughs> Pretty much. 
<laughs> Myself sorted. Nothing but oh, love. Man. Nothing but love, Gary. He's Nothing gonna start comparing love. his own pictures to his. He's gonna be like, these assholes, that. right? This is, <laughs> I don't see it. I'm way <laughs> better looking than James Franco. <laughs> yeah, right. Someone in the comments last week said I look like the um, the religious guy from Secular Talk, which I found offensive. Oh yeah, that <laughs> guy. Get the fuck out of here. I know. I was like, I don't see no, it. He's he's not You're religious. Right. He's, he's. I know. But trash. He's Jay something rather. Jay. Yeah. Jay something. I don't. Even think. You don't look like him, Gary. That guy looks like a douche. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel so much better about the comparison, Basie. Thank you. Well, he says you don't look like him. <laughs> I say you don't look. Like... You know what? James Franco looks like you. How yeah, about that? That's right. Yeah. Just, shit. He's trying to pull that Gary Diaz look off and yeah. almost yeah, get Yeah, Gary was here first. He's older, so he's perpetrating on Gary's style. I saw him. I was standing in line at the supermarket. And, you know, they had those like uh, magazines with all the celebrities, and and James Franco was wearing a diva hoodie. So I mean, he's clearly trying yeah. to <laughs> cramping his style, man. You gotta yeah. get he's on doing Twitter, black man. and white movies with Jigglypuff shirt. Well, <laughs> ripping off your shit. Snapping panties on the Vita. <laughs> Start calling her the Vita all of a sudden. <laughs> right. All right, guys. I think that's gonna wrap it up. Thank you guys so much for hanging out tonight. You see, what are you up to this week? What you got coming out? I'll be playing Destiny 2 this week and trying to focus on family, friends, and life second to Destiny 2. Uh, <laughs> I want to I see how far I can get in Trials of the Nine. I want to get ready to do the raid and get ready for this reset. So we'll see what happens. Wilson? I have got engrams to turn in, so I'm going to be going and doing some Destiny 2. So awesome. uh, I want an Aura Borealis really bad. I want it very bad. Mine's mine's exotic, Gary. You can you can take your rare and you know. Yeah, I'm I'm only rare. You could go oh. take your rare and snap its panties on your Vita. <laughs> but no, I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be doing a lot of Destiny too. Uh, I got a lot of uh, trade show stuff to get ready for too, so it's gonna be fun balancing the two. You should, as a passion project, make some of those Ingrams out of glass and see. I've how been far telling them goes. that. I have been telling them that for two years. I'd buy, right? I'd buy them all. I mean, I how long have I known you? It was like the second thing I ever said to you. Yeah. You said, I, I make glass work, and I said, you should make some engrams. <laughs> I know. There's a, there's a piece of equipment I got to get to do it that I've been sleeping on. But, yeah, the, <laughs> one of the first things Briar ever said to me was, you should make glass engrams. Make and... those engrams, man. They would sell. All you do is just create an eBay store, Amazon store. You'd be able to sit back and collect dough. Duckets, man. I'm going to buy mm. a couple hundred from you myself. <laughs> I mean, I would buy them, man. Yeah, me I mean, too. I'm loving Destiny. It oh, may awesome. or may not contain the rarity within the engram. We're talking vanilla destiny rules. You may get a purple that turns into a blue. I don't know. Shit. Oh, you motherfucker. You were <laughs> damn Rahul. Gary, <laughs> 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 what are you up to this week? What am I up to? Well, I'm desperately scraping the barrel to find a team that are kind enough to take me through the raid. Um, so that's going to be happening. Um, aside from that, not much. Probably a bit more Destiny 2, uh, a lot more James Franco, um, and maybe a little bit of Vita on the line. But oh, that's, uh, that's my like week, week wrapped up. <laughs> Nailed it. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this show. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week. If you got any feedback, let us know. You can get a hold of us at on, Revolver uh, Gamescast at gmail.com. Revolver Gamescast <laughs> at gmail.com. Yeah, also, if you do listen to the uh, the podcast on Podbean or iTunes, write a uh, review. It doesn't even have to be words. You could just say, this is a review and yeah. like it. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything, but it does make uh, blood flow dicks. to our genitals. Yeah. Hashtag dicks. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't use like the hashtag, like the number sign. You actually have to just spell out hashtag dicks. That way we yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> that way we know. That way you know you're yeah. just, we're just not being called dicks like usual. This is yeah. now... Hashtag. And yeah. this is a personal <laughs> plea to anyone that listens to this show and knows or has connections to James Franco. Let him know that I do have a, a fiance and a child, but I am willing to make that sacrifice if he's open to the offer. Um, you know, anyone just putting it out there, waiting for him to reel it in. <sighs> thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week. He put it all on the line. <laughs>